3,000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3,000 Podcast. I'm joined today by an MC <laughs> who just spat a sick verse. Strictly DT. DT, thanks for coming, man. Thank you for having me, brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. What do we call that track that you just dropped for us? Oh, it's kind of just, I didn't really have a, it was a verse I wrote for a friend and we haven't really spoken in a while. I don't know what he's up to. So I, I like to use it because I, I think it's a dope verse. So until he puts it out, <laughs> I'm just going to keep re- reusing it until, but um, yeah, that's just, it's not, there's no name for it. It's just a freestyle, just yeah, a, nice. something I've written up. Yeah. yeah. And you did do it on the fly, which was pretty cool. So uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't really, we that didn't conversation's really... always like mixed up. Everyone's like, it's not, fr- it's not a freestyle. It is a freestyle. It's not, it, it is just, it's definitely written, but it, I didn't even have any intentions of rapping today. So yeah. and it, works. <laughs> yeah, it worked out. That's it, man. <laughs> All right, so let's. People can probably tell from your accent, you're not originally from Australia, man. Let's nah, dive put it back on. in. Yeah. No. <laughs> where where are you where are you from originally? And uh, we'll get there. But how you got to be making music in Melbourne? Mm. Um, well, I was born in Seattle, Washington, and I spent pretty much half my life there before migrating over to um, Borloo, which is Perth, and I was there mainly in Fremantle area up until we moved to Melbourne in about six years ago. Yeah. So 2018, uh, we moved down to Melbourne, and we've been here since. Since, yeah. And, yeah. like, music, the music thing started, like, I'm guessing your love for music started, mm. but you didn't start making music till you're here in Oz? No, I was writing. I was writing since I was probably six or seven. Yep. And then it was, like, you know when you when you're stuck in your bedroom for being grounded for like a week you're in your bedroom and you've played with all the toys you've done all the things you start like thinking what can you do and as i started um listening to music on the radio i heard they there were some segments where they would just play instrumentals and i would just like i just try to just try to rap like whoever i was listening to on the radio and as i started getting like the cat in the hat bars off i was like this is the illest shit <laughs> and so i just kind of started writing from there and i was writing since i was like seven and even talking about whatever happened in the day it's like kind of like journaling yep. where uh, i would write what happened in the day in a rhyme form so whatever i was saying i was is like a rap but it was a story yeah and so that's kind of what started it and then really taking it seriously i was in perth just um there was a there was an a rap competition at metro city Mm -hmm. and they were a big club there yeah it's a mass it's the biggest club they have there and i applied for it not telling them that i was 16 17 did you look 18 at that stage i probably did yeah i i passed i passed on a lot of things around that time but they didn't see my like my face or anything i just submitted and then when i um when i submitted they i made it through and then it was a voting thing. Now, because I was in school, I just told the school, <laughs> bro, like, Everyone vote, vote for, me. for me. And, like, and that's the, that's the beauty about being young and kids. Like, kids are who are, like, ambitious and people will follow, like, so super easy to support you. Yeah. So I, like, smashed. <laughs> I smashed the competition. And the last part was you have to come and perform. Yeah. And so that's where I was like, oh, shit, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And so I, I ended up confessing and saying, look, guys, I'm under 18. Um, but I would love to still do it. Is there any way I can do it? They said, they hit back and said, yep, you can. You have to come with your parent. Mm -hmm. You have this, you have like, you have one security guard watching you the whole time. You're only coming in to do your part and you're getting kicked out (laughs) straight away. Really? So I went and did it and it was like, it was so funny because it was probably the worst performance for a nightclub. It was like the middle, it was like 11, 30, 12, at night, right? Mm-hmm. Midnight. And they were like, all right, we're going to kick off this competition. We got we got strictly, I think I was D. Torre back then, to come out and do his bars. And I came out and I just spat for like four minutes. Just no hook, no party vibes. It was just like, you're going to hear. Though? It was an instrumental, but I was just, ra- I rapped for like three, four minutes to these people. Who were <laughs> like 25 just, or something. Yeah, yeah, and they're ready to just dance and party. And then like as I got to hear other people, they were doing like these like, club songs and like everyone was going crazy and i just remember just watching everyone just staring at me like this and i was just barring and then i was like they're not feeling it i need to go harder so i just start rapping even harder to them and it was just like it was so painful but um 
I actually, I yeah, I ended up losing the competition, but it was a really good learning experience. It's like, all right, I really need to start like working on maybe hooks or maybe something that could structure. Yeah, structure to it because I just was so used to just rap writing raps for however until I felt it was done. For yeah. sure, and the and the other side of it is that all the kids that were voting for you can't get yeah, in no, they to can't support even get you anyway. and vote for me there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think they they probably enjoyed it because they probably got all the their emails and was like all right we got all these guys's emails we can't utilize them now but they'll be 18 in two years so i figured they'd try to give me a solid there and let me perform but it was it was horrible but also a really good learning experience and that sort of sparked something in you like okay i need to start writing some structured mm. sort of songs i need to put together some hooks some harmonies all that yeah sort of thing. yeah that was it just started writing like yeah just doing mixtapes i've done a lot of mixtapes um recorded um was finding studios to record until i ended up getting my own little setup and realizing you can just record yourself and then send it off to someone to do it to make it sound pretty mm -hmm. and that's kind of how it stemmed and it kind of grew from there who are you emulating at this point in the early when you're 16 mm. who are you looking up to and who are you wanting to sort of sound like or who are you using as a blueprint what was crazy i always tell people that i found hip-hop maybe i found hip-hop twice or maybe even three times because even now i'm finding a whole different love for it um but i would say back then i was heavily influenced by tech nine yeah um and e40 and because I was they're from, very different. Yeah, they're very different. So I from in America, like when you wherever you're born, you're pretty much and I didn't know that this was a thing. Obviously there was that East Coast, West Coast thing, mm. but even when that died down or when that started sparking up, because that probably started what, two thousand and four four maybe five, when the whole East Coast, West Coast thing started happening, wherever you were brought up you actually just listen to the people on that coast. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know anything about any East Coast rappers until I moved to um, Perth. Right. And because we were brought up like E-40, uh, Keek the Sneak, Looney Conleon, um, like it were all West Coast people. Brother Lynch Hung was like one of my favorite rappers. So why was that influence for you when you're living on the other side? Like how did that influence come for you? Like how did you miss that? Yeah. Well, I was only I was listening to what was around us, like Mac Dre and all that. Where, like, Mac Dre was our Drake right, okay. back then. When we were when we were like growing up, we would just hear and be influenced by what's happening. There was like the hyphy movement where we used to just like it's just a whole type of sound that you could just live. And the worst, the crazy, not the worst, the crazy thing about it is that you can just you can make a living off of music just living on the West Coast by itself because so, you've got a big. Captured, massive yeah. there's massive people there's like like I, I tell people this all the time in retrospect um california has more people in california than australia has in australia yeah so one state that's mm -hmm. one state we're talking maybe three four five states on this side yeah. so you could just tour this side drive down to portland do a gig drive back up to seattle do a gig you could drive up to canada do a gig like there and you can gain a huge following in a span of a couple of years, if you keep up it with For it. Sure. So when I'm listening to these artists, I'm like, yes, this is dope. We can make music like this. And I was writing to, to like that. And then I moved here and everyone was very heavily influenced by the East Coast. Yeah. But I, I think because East Coast made it so worldwide, it made it so known. And that's where I got introduced to, you know, the the, the Wu Tangs and the, um, and the Most Defs and like that kind of, I ha it sparked a whole new level of love for me. The irony was you went to the West Coast of Australia to hear about the East, East Coast, Coast of America. <laughs> exactly it. And that's what, it's kind of what happens is like you're so in your in your Bubble. area. Yeah, you're in your area and you're, you're getting drowned. You're getting flooded with all this music yeah. that you just didn't know. Oh, yeah, he's from Vallejo or he's from the Bay and they're from Seattle. And that makes it easy. You're like You feel like you're fed. Yeah. And then when you really get into it, like, there's so much music out there. There's so much influence that, and like I'm finding out that a lot of the people I'm listening to were influenced by DJ Premier and 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 all of these cats on this side. I'm like, all right, I need to like open my horizons up. And, yeah, for sure. And Even though it. DJ Premier is very East Coast mm. with his sound, mm. he's originally from Houston, and he also mm. he also 
plays music. Oh, like he makes music for everybody, but he yeah. does have a pretty distinct East Coast kind of That's thing. it. You yeah. can feel the New York in it. Like yeah. and yeah. that's and you can even say that about Griselda. Like they are from Buffalo, but they definitely have that real nice sound that just feels like New York <laughs> yeah, straight for away. Sure, for sure. <laughs> so in so when you get to Perth or Frio, mm. which is a long way from Seattle, mm -hmm. it's a different place. A whole different place. Different place. Yeah. Is that an interesting experience? Like, did it take you a while to sort of get used to being somewhere so different, man? Yeah. I think it's it helped me become more of an open-minded person because mm – -hmm. I just I, when I first moved here, I was like, I just don't get it. I don't understand the music here. I don't understand. And like, the family was was why you moved here. Yeah, yeah. So my dad and my my stepmom was originally from Perth. Yep. And my dad was in the navy, and that's how they met. Okay. And then she, he moved her back over to Seattle, and that's where she we lived for you know a while. Yeah. Then they wanted to start over, and she wanted to move back, so we did that move, and um, and it was just yeah a huge culture shock, a huge weather shock. Like it rains all the time in Seattle, yeah. And I, we 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 came in December, so I remember we were coming from snow into forty degree like sun, and I got like sick instantly. Like that's it's how, but yeah, there. that's how like un, like my body just was not for it. Yeah, and I don't even know if I'm he's still used to that that heat. It's different there in general to here. Like you know yeah. what I mean? Like it is. It's a different heat, and it's hot a lot of the year. Next level hot. So I was just like, I was always in a tank top. I couldn't get fly because I would just sweat it out. It was like so annoying. Um, that's why when like living here, I'm like, this is so good. It does remind me more of Seattle. People say that all the time. I've never been to Seattle, mm. but if people they compare it to Melbourne a lot in yeah. in similar ways. Yeah, and I think I, I think it's probably the closest to it. Like they think that Melbourne is like the New York of. The, I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> you have no idea. Yeah. Like my my. My cousin recently moved to um, New York, and she's from Seattle. And she's like, I didn't realize how slow s people from Seattle walk. She's like, people just get mad at you for walking slow in New York. Yeah. It's like, because everyone's got a place to be. They need to be somewhere. And it's, it's like London, man. Yeah, yeah. And so, the, so when they say that it's like New York, it's like, no, it's more like Seattle. Because <laughs> Seattle is way more chill. <laughs> and I would agree that Melbourne is super chill, but a good, a, it's just a, it's a good chill. Yeah. Yeah. So when you get to, to Perth or, or Frio, mm -hmm. where was it again? So uh, it was in Cardinia. So we we're 6163, but like Fremantle was a few suburbs down. And Fremantle's a pretty cool place and mm. there's a, there's stuff going on that's like its own little thing aside from Perth as well. Yeah. Are you going into Perth at that stage to sort of find more culture or are you staying you're hanging in Frio? I was mainly I mainly stayed in Fremantle. I felt like I didn't realize until I was an adult that Fremantle was a very big calling for me. And having a lot of, like, having my best friend, uh, James, who lived in Frio, I used to just take the 99 down to his place. And, like, he lived literally walking distance from the strip. So we, whether we were 15 or whether we were 21, we would be just walking down the strip and we can do whatever we wanted. Or we can find, you know, friends that are in the area. There's a time zone. If we were underage, we'd hit the time <laughs> zone, wasted, hitting and go find a place to go hang out. Or we... Or we would like, you know, there's just so much to do. And even when you're o uh, over age, then you're hitting the clubs and you're finding, you know, Metro's Frio and there's the Newport. And then you go down, there's Mojo's. And that's kind of where we saw there was like open mics there. And, and it became quite easy to find like find a rhythm in what you wanted to do, whether mm -hmm. it was, you know, go fishing or go rapping. Like they had it all yeah. in that hub. I felt more I feel more connected to Fremantle than I do Perth. And I always said if I did move back, it would be in Fremantle. Yeah. I'm not moving anywhere else if it was that. <laughs> but there, man, like I haven't been to Fremantle for probably ten years. But that mm. that strip, it was pretty crazy. There's a lot going on because everybody had like there's not much going on anywhere out of there. Mm. So it, on like a Friday, Saturday night, oh, yeah. it's pretty nuts down there, man. Yeah, it's a it's a different. It's a whole different. It's oh, how do I explain it? It's like it's it's a rowdy like could be dangerous place yeah. 
It, the and fast food easily. joints after midnight. Oh are yeah, fucking they, dangerous man. Yeah, the, and that's actually <laughs> funny because they don't. They're not even there no more. Like they, oh, really? they, they shut them down. Yeah, they shut. They shut. The uh, Hungry, Hungry Jacks. Jacks. Yeah, the Hungry Jacks that was, was a nuts. spot, man. That was just, <laughs> like they, they should have just had a police station in the Hungry Jacks because that was probably where ninety nine percent of so the stuff happened. So they shut that down. It's gone, man. Yeah, and because too, it's just too much. Trouble. I mean, I wouldn't know what the reason is because I'm like, I'm pretty sure the owners of Hungry Jacks is like, just keep it open, just keep it because like everyone was going there. Like it was literally right across the street from the Metro's Frio. Yeah. So you would just do what you need to do then cross the street. And if it wasn't that, then you just hit the one of the kebab shops right next door. And, yeah. and so that was like, it was just our routine or we would just stay at the in the Frio house and just like chill and, you know, like make a fire at the back and it was, it was, an, it was a vibe. Yeah. Did you head back to Seattle to visit and that sort of thing? You just stayed there? Yeah, I pretty much visited every year yeah. until my son was born. So from 15 years old till 28, I was there once a year, wow. maybe twice a year. Yeah. And Just, that's a, that's an effort, man, because you got to fly back to the east and then get to to get to yeah yeah like it's there's no direct flights to Seattle from Perth. It was a pain. <laughs> it was a pain in my pockets and a pain in in my mental because it was like you going there and then you're flying. You're flying from here to he like from there to here and then there to then we'd have to go to L.A. The L.A. to Seattle, Seattle yeah. or we'd go from there to Hawaii or something. And then it takes you a, a week to get used to the time frame. And then I only have like a week or two left before I have to fly back. Yeah. And then do the same thing all over again. Did your friends get it? Were they like, man, like, why are you staying in Australia? You should stay back here. Or they, did they? Everyone did that. Yeah. Everyone on my family, they, they just have like a whole campaign about why I should move back every time I come back. And I don't know, something, something in me was telling me like, I am living this this whole thing for a reason, like this experience mm -hmm. that I shouldn't just give up on it. Yeah. You know, I felt there were times where I felt like, you know, I think it's time. Like I felt like sometimes I can go back and maybe give it six months because I can always come back home. I can always come back here if I want to. Yeah. But as I was getting older, I realized that like Seattle didn't feel like home mm -hmm. and I just didn't know where I was going to take it. If I if I did go back and just seeing where everyone's at and seeing where I'm at here and the the level of opportunities compared to the um, the way the government helps their people um, over here compared to there, like I could start seeing a pattern where I'm like, all right, I'm blessed to be able to see these things and witness this for myself mm -hmm. and I could take the stuff that I love about America and bring it to, to Australia and then utilize or put to put together what I want to do here mm -hmm. with that same mentality of like that worth ec the work ethic that they have in America because they just overwork people in America they just work three four jobs and to still be broke is kind of crazy to me it is it's yeah. because wealth is sort of something you kind of need to be born into there you can't really work like you can work you hard, can but, but it's, it's hard mm, and like it, there's a lot of moral like morally challenging things like sometimes you might have to do something that's not in your morals to get ahead and i just don't feel that's a didn't i didn't i never really liked that kind of mentality and yes that happens here too but i think it's not as bad or severe yeah, for sure. you know they really have like this this whole like me versus you thing like mm. if, I, if i can get it before you can get it or if i can get it and keep you from getting it because then i get more is like a whole there's a whole culture of that and it it doesn't feel right to me. And in Australia, people are like, oh, if he's going to do it, we'll let him go. I can't be bothered doing that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They'll We're be like, all right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's it. That's yeah. <laughs> so that's let's right. get back on the musical journey, man. Yeah. So after you're 16 and you're, you're playing overage gig mm. and then you're thinking, I'm going to structure my music more, so you start to write hooks. What are you recording on? You're recording on a little MacBook and a, and a fucking – Plug in microphone. Or no, what you doing? nah. It was like it was a good setup. I had like I had met some friends who had a studio and they had like artists and they had like a a label that they were trying to build up. And this, you're still sixteen. Yeah, I was yeah. seventeen, probably seventeen at this point. But yep. like seventeen, I was I basically was paying every weekend 
to go and record a track or two mm -hmm. every weekend. And I said, I'm going to make like a mixtape and then I'll like just try and start flogging that out. Um, as I did that, they asked me to, you know, join the crew and, and record there. You don't have to, you don't have to pay and all that. Good deal. So I was like, all right, cool. Like, he's like, don't worry about paying for now. We'll, we'll work it out. And I was like, all right, well, I'll come back. And we, we started making like a crew of a thing and we were recording for, for we recorded and we were doing like, they were doing, they're trying to do underage gigs and, and I was like, all right, I'll try and, you know, help and wherever I can. And I performed there and and it became like quite it became like I was trying to trying to grow a fan base that way. And um, as that started happening, I started making original music and then coming out. What was happening after that? We we kind of had like we, we were building up something and then we kind of had like a falling out where it was just not lucrative to have um them around anymore and if we were to go into like specifics i'm just it was very creative differences i know at the end of it and then we just had like a big falling out where they were trying to charge me for everything that i done from the time we started working together to to now and i'm like oh this is this is not <laughs> what i what i signed up for yeah. and i didn't sign that's anything why yeah that's why contracts would yeah be, just even just like a, a a paper trail of you can use the studio for free, so you can say yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, that and that's what was weird was like when we came to the end of it, he was like they were just trying to say you know well you you have you've racked up a bit of a of, of a bill, and I said oh okay like what is that, and then they try to say well you've you know you've been recording here for like six years and. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, yes. But we were under the, it was under the impression that, it was under the impression that we were going to work together. I was going to record and we'll put the music out and anything that we're making, we're going to put in an account, which I gave to them. So every gig and I was like, everything that we're making, put in this account and we'll put it towards like future projects or whatever the case may be. Mm. Anyway, we... I, from the shows and all the rec like everything I was doing from that six year span, even shows that they didn't get me, I put in that account. Yeah. Then when they said, then when I said, all right, let's split it because we were supposed to do 50 50, let's split it and I'll take my half and you take your half and we'll call it. And they were like, oh, well, you owe this much money for recording. It gets and messy. This, yeah, it, get, it got real messy real quick. And like, if you want to break it down, it's like, it was like, it didn't make sense to me because even when they said we're going to rebuild the studio, I put money in to rebuild the studio as well. So I was like, all right, if we're doing this, I'll help you out. Let's, I put the hours in to build it. We just did a whole thing together. So I'm thinking we're cool. We're, we're we understand where there's an end goal here. We want to work together to get this. And after a while it became, it just became, it just didn't work. It wasn't working out yeah. where where they were doing other things. And I was like, well, I have specific needs that I need to get going. So whether you guys want to split off or not, and then it just pieced it. We had to piece it up after that. So mm -hmm. it didn't work out that way. And ever since then, I just bought my own little like setup. And it was like so much easier to just write and record and then send it off to someone mm -hmm. and still pay someone, which is, I'm happy to do, which I was happy to do before then mm -hmm. as well, which is why I felt a bit jaded because I was like, if you wanted to, to do this, I could have just kept paying you from the beginning. Yeah. So I was like paying them every week, which I had no issues with. But now when they told me not to worry about it, I was coming, even coming over just to hang out. I didn't know I was getting billed for it. You know? <laughs> so I was like, if I had known we were getting billed or if you gave me like in the year said, hey, man, you've been here this long, anywhere in between then and now, I would have I would have been like, oh, OK, I didn't know this is where we're at. Like I, I'll. Definitely. Miscommunication. The whole miscommunication thing. And so we, we, I lost all the money from there and just reset. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm just going to work and save up a little bit and then try and get my, the reputation I have, just keep gigging and just bring it to me now instead of putting it to the, uh, yeah. to the bank. And so then you, like, so who's doing the production then? So I would find, I would either have, producers that I know and like we'd work together and then I would either pay them or 
they would give me the beats back then. Like back then it was like that. Otherwise it was just mixtapes. So I was just getting the mixtapes. Jack and beats, beats, putting them on a CD, selling them on the streets. And that's, and that was like the most I could do at that stage until I was making my own. Oath One was like my first producer I got to work with who is a Perth like producer, really super dope um, producer and super nice guy. And he's so for the culture that he just, he doesn't play any of these games. He makes tapes, <laughs> he makes uh, vinyl, and then he just fucks off. <laughs> he, like, he do, like he does it all the time. Like he'll pop up out of nowhere on Instagram and just post a few snippets of the beats he's making. And then he'll just delete his Instagram or like he won't, he won't, you can't go and find him when you want to find him. Find him. So yeah. he just does that because he's like, all right, so the people that do follow me might see I've got something else coming yeah. up. They'll hit me up. I yeah. might be able to sell a few. Is that the mentality? Yeah, like yeah, this? that's it. And he's worked with like Lewis Parker and, and like really dope rappers and, and, and producers and he just sticks to his own. But he's not like in it for making, you know, making money. He's just in it for the culture. I, and I respect that. Mm. Mm. So then that started a whole new journey, I guess, when you're working with other people because you get the opportunity to, hey, go on. <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dad. Hey, go on. How are you, man? Sorry. You're all right. Good? What's happening? Are you doing it? Yeah, we're doing one. Oh, okay. That's all right. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll be here for, yeah, for an hour or so. Yeah, that's all right. All right. Oh, sorry, man. You're all good. Andy, uh, Dad's interrupted anyway, so you don't have to tiptoe around. <laughs> he's taking it. He's, um, you're all good, man. Yeah, I'll good. just I'll chop that. For Easy, a man. I'll just do a little clap so I know where it is. Mm. We're about half an hour in. Um, cool. Do you want to come out of the bathroom, Andy, before we jump back in? Unless he's on the bathroom. Yeah. I don't <laughs> don't mean to rush you. Or yeah. <laughs> He'll be right. We'll, yeah. we'll just come back. Cool. Um, so we were talking about producers working. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at this point, you're working with those dudes, then Oath, and then now your 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 schedule's open. You can work with sort of whoever. pretty much. Yeah. I just started. Like I started. I was hosting gigs. I was, ho was not hosting gigs. I was hosting events, um, just to kind of get some extra paper. Find out that it's like. A lot more money in it than doing your own gigs. So I was like hosting uh, nightclubs, hyping them up, um, and then making enough to go buy. Excuse me, no. making enough to go buy um, instrumentals or work with producers or recording or something like that. So use that up, and um, then we yeah. Then I was making, and then I met. Um, Ralph One, who also goes as Kez ninety three now. I'm trying to remember. He changes his name all the time. <laughs> <clears throat> I joined um I joined a crew a dance crew called Cultural Renegades and that introduced me to Kez 93 who brought this beat to me that he's like oh I'm a producer you want to try this beat see if you like it and it like opened up a whole new like horizon of of like flows and lyrical content so i was like let's just do an ep together mm -hmm. and we did note to self um parlay was our first track and to this day, it's like one of my favorite songs because it's just, it's something that's not what I usually do, but brought something out of me that made me feel like so good. And, and it felt nice to put something negative into something positive because we were both kind of going through something at the time. Mm -hmm. I was kind of going off the breakup of the, of my past crew and all that. And we, and we just kind of gelled really quickly. So we, as we had that momentum, we built like a whole eight or nine track EP Mm -hmm. And um and just took off with that. Yeah. And it was like it was so good. He was from Sydney. I was in Perth and we would meet up and then we drop this and then we kind of left it at that. But I feel like we're just kind of waiting for the right moment to do it again because I really I really think that he brings out a different side of me when it comes to writing. What is that because the beats speak to you differently? Yeah, yeah. So the beats like beats all I always need to I, – I feel like the beat needs to speak to my soul before I could really get into the writing aspect of it because if it really hits, then it writes itself really. So I can force myself to write to a beat, but it never sounds as good as if I – if like it captures me and I can get into it and just dive and, t and, and break it down bit by bit. Mm. So when we were doing it, it just felt – it just felt so nice to, to feel no pressure, no um, – no standards and it was away from like you know getting away from 
you know, like boom bap rap or or um, conscious rap or commercial rap. It was just away from all of that. It was just like, this is what I'm feeling. This is what it is. So what would you call it if you had to name it something? I think it's like a bit of house okay. or lo-fi. Yeah. Um, but I d it's still rap. Technically, it is because like, I'm still rapping on it. But mm -hmm. like the beats themselves just didn't – it didn't really match my whole – my whole catalog that I had built up from the times I've done tracks with like Hobson and Swizz from Funk Volume to this, you know, it's like a whole evolution of like changing up. And even with my mixtapes, I have, I've done tracks over like System of a Down Beats because I just love just changing it up, you know, mm -hmm. from Kanye West beats to System of a Down to, you know, more commercial, like commercial underground, like Necro beats, like all of that was just all me just playing with, whatever captured my soul so you can't just drop hobson's name and then not really go into no, it. Yeah. <laughs> tell us just about day that drop. Yeah. okay okay yeah so hobson was really on the brink of blowing up um but his he was just working so hard mm. and he was doing i remember i was i found him on myspace yeah. and so what are we talking now like 2009 or something yeah it was probably 2008 or nine so that's when i was like 17 18 mm -hmm. and right when i brought right right before i was bringing my first mixtape out i i i hit him up for a verse and i flipped a um brother lynch hung beat and he was like i love brother lynch hung this is a fucking dope like dope idea i'll um I'll do it. So we we got this verse from 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 Funk Volley from Hobson. I was like, I can't believe this is it. And then he blew up like shortly after, like yeah. fully blew up. He did real quickly, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He hit real big, real fast. And since the ill, I think it was from the Ill Minds. And him, him, same thing. He just worked so hard. He produced his own. He filmed his own. He yeah. recorded. He wrote. It, it was a lot. He so. did, didn't he do, I'm trying to remember now, didn't he do something where he did like a song every day for a week or so? No, that was, I it? Yeah. think that was Russ. Uh, Russ was doing that, yeah. but I don't know, I don't know if Hobson, he might have done that to well, be he, honest. He flipped, he flipped the track that he liked and did one a week for like Oh, a okay, week. see, something he like, could have yeah, done that yeah, too. He did, but he, he, not, he nailed the sort of social stuff and be like, I'm going to get in people's faces real mm. quick and. Like, yeah. Notice me. yeah, but I also noticed the with the ill minds. It was basically because he was dissing everyone. So it's very like that's that's literally how every, a lot of people get in. You know, Fifty Cent with um, what was that track he did way back in the day where he just dissed everyone. everyone yeah. yeah, I can't, I can't. It's it's literally left my mind. But I've literally listened to it like <laughs> once a year. Um, and it's the same thing with the Kendrick and and Drake now and and, and J Cole stuff. Like it just really blows up because people love that controversy. Mm -hmm. I think that's the same thing with battle rap. Like they just love that 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 confrontation with each other. Yeah. So that's I think Hobson really jumped on that. Just just dissed a bunch of people, people. and it it really it took off. He made them notice him. Yeah, exactly. That's and that's the same thing what Fifty Cent said. It's like if you're not gonna be my friend, then at least be my enemy, mm. and then it makes it like fun. And that dude can hold a grudge. Man. Oh my gosh, the <laughs> petty king, <laughs> petty king. This he's guy. He's still going. Like obviously, Diddy's like in a lot of trouble, but he's still. He so doesn't much stop, and man. And even like. Who was it? Um, Floyd Mayweather. Even like, bro, he was like, man, you can't even read. No, and all yeah, this he said, I'll I'll pay you fifty grand <laughs> if you could read a page out of the, the Harry, Harry Potter, Potter book. book. Yeah. And I Fuck was like, I know. <laughs> I know damn well I'd be so mad, but you know he replied so good. Really? Did you remember? Do you remember Floyd's oh, that reply? That was the ice bucket challenge. He's like, "Fuck yeah. the bucket of ice." And yeah, he throws yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Do you remember Floyd's reply, bro? What All right. So Floyd uploaded a photo of his check, and he said, "Read that," and it was like a check of like fifty mil or something. Yeah. And I was like, "There you go." That's yeah. true. I mean, if you can make fifty mil and not read, do you need to know how to read? read. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, I saw a clip the other day of. Um, of what's that guy's name? Uh, another one. What's he, uh, Cal, DJ Khaled, right? Khaled, yeah. And, and he 
can't even speak properly. I don't know if it's yeah. a dyslexic thing. He gets all these words mixed oh, up. Oh yeah, man. He he's can't definitely. Even pronounce. He, yeah, it could be dyslexic. It could be. He's he, not that intelligent. Yeah, like it, it, it's one of those things where his mind goes faster than his brain. Like his mouth goes faster than his brain, and that happens with me sometimes too. Because <laughs> I try, I get ahead of myself. I have to like constantly tell myself, "All right, slow down. Oh, yeah. You're losing your words." But he don't give a shit. He just fucking like just blurs it out. And even when they're trying to correct him, he's like, "That's what I'm saying." Like, yes. yeah, he doesn't, know, <laughs> and yeah. then repeats the same word he said before, <laughs> but in it, but it, which is the wrong word. Yeah, still, <laughs> his conf- his, his confidence goes a long way. Yes, when people say, you know, that's not a real word, he goes, yeah, but it's a Callan word, and that's the I, way I see it. I could not. I mean, I'm confident that I'm a great writer. I'm a great MC, but I don't think I could walk into into Def Jam and put my music on the thing and play it to some random people in the Def Jam offices. I don't just I just don't think I could do that. Like to me that just feels so cr- but he Kanye can just go in and just be like you, you got to listen to this and like he was nobody then. Yeah. <laughs> to me that's just that's that's a next level like confident individual. Yeah. Believing in yourself goes a long way, but mm. there's also a fine line of believing in yourself and being delusional. Yeah. So that's the really th- and that's the thing that we only hear of remember of the people that are successful. Of there course. are a lot of people that, that are out there that have just, you know that have never made it. They're like, I was going to be the next big thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. There's a fine line there. Yeah, I, I and like to me, I feel that Australia is a different kettle of fish when it comes to that. When they see someone doing the most, they are off it. Yeah, and it's kind of strange because it's like I don't, I don't want to be. I don't want to be hated on because I'm trying hard. You know, I'm not a try hard. I'm trying hard. That's the difference. It's like I'm just trying to do stuff. And I respect people who who are like putting the initiative. I mean, making a studio like and just kind of building off of it. That's yeah. as you're not a try hard. You're just trying. Hard. Yeah. yeah. There's a difference There's between a difference. being a try hard and trying hard. Yeah. A, tr- a try hard is somebody who's trying to be something that they're not. And somebody who's trying hard is somebody who <laughs> believes in what they want and is doing everything they can to make yeah, that a reality. Exactly. So that's where I, I, I'm seeing, like, again, going back and forth from America to to see, um, to Perth, Perth yeah. I'm like, I'll go and drive in America, go to a gas station, someone's trying to sell me a CD. That's annoying. Yeah. You know? And, and like, I respect the hustle, but it's annoying. Mm. If I did that here, can you imagine? Yeah. It's crazy. Oh my gosh, they would they would belt me. They would they yeah. and and not to mention because Australia isn't I personally don't think Australia is hip hop like I don't think they know hip hop. No, it's well, we're a small small community. Everyone we talk about hip hop and loves hip hop is a very small community. Very small. Especially in Perth, man. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the amount of imagine the amount of people I would stop at a gas station how many people actually listen to, to hip hop? Yeah. That's the kind of difference. Where it's like you know, a good eighty percent of people in America listen to hip hop, mm. and that's where the difference. I fe- I started seeing the difference in totally. in what what America is to to Australia and a small market as well, though, man. That's the thing. Like yeah. here, like you said, twenty five million people. You got twenty five million people in California. Mm. Not to mention you've also got tourists. Mm-hmm. Like my dad, who just stuck his head in before, <laughs> yeah. we went to the states ten years ago. We get to Hollywood, and I'm like, "Don't take any CDs off anybody." <laughs> you know what I mean? But my dad had never really travelled in in the US. Yeah. We get there, and straight away, this guy's like, "You're from Australia. Yeah. You're have a CD." And gives my dad's like, "Thanks." I'm like, "Give it back, man. <laughs> I told you, don't take it. They're gonna ask for ten bucks for that." Yeah, you know. But we don't see that here at no, all. No, no. I give CDs away. <laughs> Well, like that, I yeah, personally, sort of have to. yeah, but see, even then, I don't give it to them unless I know they like what I like. For example, I'll do a gig, mm-hmm. and then if people come up to me and say that was a great gig, I'll say, "Can I give you a CD?" Because the the difference is, is like I know t- nine times out of ten they're gonna throw that CD out, and really? I don't want to. I yeah. like I think that like if I'm handing out CDs to people, I was doing it in Perth, like when Method Man and Red Man came in. Mm-hmm. That was another thing I was supposed to support. But I didn't. They didn't. They didn't put the promoters didn't put me on because of the whole. There's a whole thing around that. But I didn't get. I didn't get it. So but I. Red actually, Man showed you some love as well. That's yeah. That was cool. That was further. That was like a few years ago. Mm. But like back when he was here, I would have loved to have capitalized on it. But instead, I went out to the front of 
Method Man and Red Man show and handed out CDs there. I think that's different to pair it compared to like going to anywhere. Totally. Well, you, you, you they're there. They love mm-hmm. hip hop. They love rap. As they're coming out, As I handed out like a hundred CDs. Yeah. And it was, it worked really well because people have hit me like, they may have seen me out another time and I was performing and they were like, bro, I got your CD from that time. And it, and it takes like a year or two to get that effect. Mm-hmm. But it's it's one of those things where I, I have to understand the market and know that these guys aren't just going to pay for a CD. Yeah. America's like that now. Like they should that you can make a lot of money just selling CDs on the street because people are into it and it's part of that culture yeah. we're here we're still learning what our culture really is yeah. yeah especially in perth man like you've got to think it's a very mining working mm. class kind of area yeah and a lot of those people they're listening to their rock music stuff. Mm-hmm. you know what i mean like i understand hip-hop has come through in mainstream a fair bit but yeah it's not it's not huge there no no i mean and i would still say like to an extent it's not huge here but it, it may, it's very mainstream, though, like hip-hop music, you know what I mean? Yes. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But I'm saying in the sense of like, all right, I'm trying – can you give me any artist that kind of blew up here without international support? Well, like, yeah. yeah. It, well, it, it, it definitely does happen from time to time. Mm. And every now and then there will be an artist – that goes international, but Australia picks up on them first. Mm. Which all the and similar thing will happen in Europe, right? Yeah, yeah. But but it doesn't happen that often. Yeah. But like you look at if you look at so the biggest uh, music democracy, you know, the Triple J Hottest One Hundred, right? Mm-hmm. Kendrick with Humble gets number one. Mm-hmm. Now you need probably a couple of million votes mm. to get number one. Mm. So from once that happens, I say it's pretty commercial. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And that's not like your sort of – that's not your cheesy commercial stuff. Kendrick was still pushed – like it was a commercial song for him. Yeah. But it's not an overly commercial version of hip-hop. Or really. Yeah. But I, I also I also point that out to like just the amount of marketing that TDE does. Yeah. They do it to a point – and they're amazing at – like they, they – but like they are – the way they've done it, was start in their neighborhood first. Yeah. And like before he was getting that, he had gotten love from Snoop Dogg, uh, the the game and all of them in that one city. And even before that, they were traveling around with Tech 9 doing gigs supporting Tech 9 and that's how they got noticed for uh by Dr. Dre. Right. Yeah. So like it's grassroots the case. Exactly. Yeah. And what I've noticed is like we aren't really putting our people up like for next you know they um i i don't know the full origin story but i mean one four to me seemed like a really like a big hip-hop crew which i thought i felt like they were getting international love and then blew up here because they got international love or was it would tell me if you know anything (laughs) different well i think the i look i'm not a aficionado an aficionado on one four but they had a huge sort of like Islander Polynesian following, yeah. which probably wasn't as much in here, but it definitely happened in Australia. Yeah. But I know that they're definitely big in in New Zealand. Mm. But th- the thing that sent them into the stratosphere was there was that Heady One track and then they did the remix of that. Heady yeah. One and um, AJ Tracy uh, that sampled – the Chili Pepper song. Anyway, and they yeah. did the remix of that, and then that, then they get big in the UK. Yeah, I thought that's what they. I thought the UK kind of blew them up. Yeah, yeah, but that whole because they kind of were into that. They mm. got into that grime kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Did you hear? Did you watch uh, Burn Gently? The the doco. Yeah, yeah. I like that's probably the biggest thing that took me that took away from me was watching that and seeing how. Bliss and Esso and Hilltop Hoods were like, we were, there was no rap. There was no hip hop in all these festivals and all that. We were in the Ann Moore spot. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, but that's but, pretty Sydney focused, that doco though. Is like, it? Well, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm still learning. I yeah. know that I, I wasn't raised here, so I was still catching. I'm still catching up to what everyone has been doing, and that's why I love these podcasts because I can listen to like 
hearing little Jace talk about Paran and 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 uh, Saint Kilda, I'm driving across there like I don't know any of this side of that. Like I'm driving, I've, I literally drive through it all the time, and I've never felt like it was like dangerous. But that's because it was maybe back then, or I'm just not in those areas. Like all of it was like a whole new shock to me. Yeah, it's definitely changed, and and, th- and that is kind of cool. I got a dude the other day who messaged me on Instagram and said, mm. "Man, I've been here for three years from the UK, and I've." this podcast is my source of finding out about Melbourne subculture. I'm like, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. He's like, I learned heaps from just hearing people talk about their stories. Yeah. I need to, and that's what I'm catching up on because I was so focused, especially when I moved here, I'm so focused on American hip hop. Like what are we doing? What's moving on? What's happening? And obviously that, do, uh, like to an effect affects us as well mm-hmm. similar to a politics like whatever they're doing we're kind of like around yeah. that and and it made me like when i'm watching burn gently and seeing how they were hustling and and trying to get a name for just hip-hop mm-hmm. i'm like they're not ready for all of like all these different varieties of hip-hop you totally. know totally yeah even if you look at say big day out was the biggest you know uh touring festival that we had for a long time i think mm. it finished in 2015 or something but even when that was happening in the 90s and 2000s, yeah. it was very alternative rock and there'd be one sort of hip-hop act. Mm, and yeah. that, So like for a while when I was a kid, or not kid, but you know, early 20s, it might be J5, which is sick. You go see J5 yeah. or it might be Exhibit one year or it might yeah. be, you know, insert – commercial-ish hip-hop act here. That's right. That was, you only got one. That's and right. And they weren't even on the main stage. Yeah. So it's the whole rock, in that alternative or mainstream kind of, it was very focused on alternative music mm. and hip-hop music wasn't even there yeah. for a long time. Yeah. You know? So now we're looking at like hip-hop in a specific sense to be like accepted in this bracket, right? But we have people here who have, you know, Motley is a very, very good, good example of like a specific type of hip hop that doesn't get enough recognition or you can look at um you know nomad who's got you know he's he's a bit commercial but he's also a bit uh, like he's a bit lyrical on his on his side he's kind of like a j cole of of Mm -hmm. of of melbourne i would say or the polynesian j cole i call him um all of these guys don't like i feel like there's so many I, i can go on forever about different artists but like there's so many different styles. Even I would even include myself in that. Like my style of hip hop isn't quite like what the popular Australian hip hop is today, or whatever is popular in today's world. And but then, popular Australian hip hop has shifted a lot. Yeah, it shifts all the time. Right. Like almost every six months. Yeah. Exactly. So it could it could be one day it's the spotlight is on that. But I just think yeah yeah you're right you're right that does keep moving because for a mm. while it was. That faster grime sort of thing, mm-hmm. that, you know, the Fracture, Alex Jones, yep. Wombat, Shadow, that, Shadow, yeah. you know, like, um, you know, uh, what's his name from Sydney, uh, Chilling It, sort of yeah. really took with that nerve, you know what I mean? Yeah, and word. then it, and then it shifts again, you yeah, know, and then it goes down more of that Polynesian kind of. Where is it at now? Of, do you think? I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I know what I like, and, yeah. I, and I do. I do like. Different genres of, mm. of, of well, sub genres you should say. Yeah, sub genres. You, you just you don't you don't you don't know. Yeah. And like Alacor and Seven Six that came on the other day, like mm-hmm. the song that they just released, I was like playing it to my partner yesterday, and I'm like, this is such a good, well produced, well written. It's a great track. Yeah. The timing for that, I just feel like isn't like that's not going to go radio now because radio's not there. Mm. But. Ten years ago, that was like, yeah, you definitely hear that on the radio. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you change the music that you make. Yeah. You make the music that you make that you love. It's yeah, it's the timing whether that aligns with what is commercially popular at the time. So then, this is why I asked, um, what's hitting now? Because in America, they're shifting. Yep, it's going to country now, big time. Yeah, but that this is the thing as a, as an Aussie kid who's always paid attention to what's happening in a music in America musically mm. because of a love of hip hop and alternative kind of music. Yeah. Country's always been there. Yes. Maybe not 
maybe not, not in the forefront. Not well, <laughs> but it was like you know, I'd watch the fucking Grammy Awards, and it was a lot of country music, mm. and I'd just be waiting for that one time that Snoop would get yeah. up and do a song or something <laughs> yeah, like that, exactly. right? You know, yeah. like but but the country music's always been huge. You listen to the charts. When I was DJing, I would always all right, what's popular? You listen to the uh, Hot 100 charts. Mm-mm. There's always been a lot of country in there. Yeah, but now I think the maybe spotlight. It's, it's the Taylor Swift effect, maybe mm. that maybe some people that are more of the tastemakers are getting influenced and so it's kind of becoming cooler to like that. I don't yeah, know. I see it. I see what you're saying. Because like, Beyonce making fucking That's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's shifting. And like, I'm now listening. I'm like, why the fuck am I listening to country now? Like, I'm like, I, two seconds ago, I was listening to freaking grime and, and, and this and that and, and drill music. And I'm like, it's just all shifting. <laughs> like, it it's is, shifting constantly. It's it is. The, it, definitely, it definitely is. And I think that things go through waves like that though. Yeah. Like if you think in the early 2000s, the Brit pop kind of thing was happening where, you know, a lot of people are, are making that kind of full indie English sounding pop music. Yeah. That has a moment. Yeah. You don't hear that in the US anymore. Yeah. Everything goes through these little sort of waves. Mm. I wonder what the next one is then. But that's how you make the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's if anyone had a crystal ball. Yeah. Man. But that's like it. You, you go back ten years, if you thought that someone like Central C would break in America doing English kind of mm. rap, which isn't so grime has a bit of a moment, but then mm-hmm. you wouldn't say what he does is grime. That's just like English rap. I don't think, yeah. I wouldn't call him grime. But how would you pick that he would break there? Like I, I think he just was good at marketing and, and pushed himself. Wait, you're t- Central sees the guy with the one line, right? That one line that everyone talks about, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he's now got multiple songs over there. He's like a thing. True, yeah. true. Yeah, that's fuck. It's weird because I, I, to me, the those like drop the beat out, say these really this one line is like the new thing. Yeah. Well, not new thing now, but I'm like, it's always been a thing. Yeah. You know, what's the Billie Eilish one? Like that guy, he he just. Did that and that flew and that flew and now everyone like, oh, yeah. what's the the Armani, girl with the Armani hair? Armani the White was uh, he, the Billy Eilish. Yeah, I think yeah. It, yeah. And then there's another the girl Spice Ice Spice. Ice Spice. The, yeah. the just the line like yeah. now they just need one good line, drop it out, and then it's good. She was also in the box with Taylor Swift at the Super Bowl, which helps propel you. Into no, it. but see that. Okay, this is. That helps. I love this. Yeah, it's yeah, like, it's like, it helps. It definitely helps because. But she blew up. She blew up before then, and then that's sure. just elevated. But so now they're just it, like, yeah. yeah. Now they're just trying to find ways to. And this is where this is what I was saying to you earlier. Like, when does it stop becoming about the music? Mm. Like we're over here thinking, all right, if I write this line, this will gain this much. Or if I do this, like, why are we looking for that? Like, rather than like when Lauren Hill was like, I'm just going to sing with a fucking guitar. And if my voice breaks, my voice breaks. And then whatever, it, that's the raw thing I'm going to play. And you're going to have this as an album. And like that to this day, people listening to. And I totally get that. And Lauren Hill, the miseducation of Lauren Hill is an amazing album. Mm. No, I was talking about the other one. Oh, the, the other one. <laughs> the, 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 the one she did live. Okay. Right. I forgot what it's called. But she like basically is just a guitar yeah. and she's singing and like her voice is breaking. And that's what, that was the thing that everyone was saying. Like, oh, she doesn't sound, you know, professional. It's raw and authentic. That's right. But now there's something called social media, which is the only, well, not the only, but pretty mm. much the quickest and safest way to break your music and to reach a bigger audience. Yeah. People now are releasing one track that people use to go viral on TikTok as some sort of a dance or fucking whatever it is, mm, a trend. Mm. And that's all they need to do. That's corny though. But that's but this is <laughs> but this is the industry. That yeah, is, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is where right. it's got to. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's when you look at those I think a lot of people become popular now with those like reaction channels. If you get the right people to react, and I think that's what with that Central C dude, Mm. the first line of the song is, How can I be homophobic? My bitch is gay. Yeah, exactly. And all these people that are doing those reaction videos are like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's come in with this crazy line. And that's. That's how people get your attention now. Yeah, but see, that's what I'm saying. Like, if if you're focusing on. I guess it's clout. If you're focusing on the clout or the attention or that, rather than saying, yo, this song is so dope. Yeah. Like we can make like a really good song. It really just like where, where I guess where's the line? Like when are we going to say, yo, guys, like we, this isn't quality enough. Now we're questioning whether Drake or Kendrick's verses are AI or not. <laughs> because it's like we should be able to tell the difference. But I mean, AI is getting good. So we yeah. might not be. But like it's coming to a point now where we're like, 
did they really like write? Is it is it written with a lot of awareness or consciousness, or is it like this is it? Like, this is it. But this yeah. is where we're at in the world of of art, not just music, in art in general. Mm. You know, like, and the thing is, the sad truth is, the the most original, the the most pure content is not necessarily, or is more than often not the stuff that gets the credibility and, and shine it deserves. Yeah. That's the sad truth. Yeah. That, and that's, what's, that's what pisses me off is because I've, I've met so many artists that deserve so much. They deserve to be on the big day out stages or what are the new ones today? You know, well, like, none of them yeah, they don't even exist. <laughs> they just drop it off, you yeah. know, like, but you know, blues and roots and all of all these, stuff, like yeah. we, like I always, I love Sampa the great. And like, mm-hmm. I almost feel like she went overseas and then blew up. Blew Cause up. everyone's like, yeah, that's our girl. And yeah. it's like, it feels like why do what it feels to me like people need to leave in order to get it. And I don't want to believe, that that's what it is yeah but like again you'd see it yourself you've got a point of difference when you're in a different country different accent yeah you've got like even talking to people like fracture when he came here from the uk mm. he's got obviously an english accent but he's mm. also that's a point of difference a lot of people yeah. are rapping here you all of a sudden you sound different yeah you know that helps like does it uh, but you know what i mean like yeah. if you're okay so say like you go to the UK and you've got an Aussie accent. People are like, that's that Aussie guy who's rapping. Mm-hmm. But here, you're the Aussie guy with 5,000 other Aussie guys. Mm. Point of difference is always good. I felt out. that if, okay, okay, because like I felt different when it came to me starting, when I started like doing shows, I felt this overwhelming sense of hate. And, because of your accent. And that's what I realized after a few years. After doing shows for a few years. Even, I would even say it happened maybe four months ago. I could tell you right now, like, someone would be like, why does he rap in an American accent? Yeah, but and that's then, how you talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, And the worst part is, is like, I was just... So, like, my accent may not be as thick now as it was then. Yeah. But, like, when I started rapping, it was probably really thick because I had just moved. But... They were like not con- like they just didn't like. And then once I started doing, I I started doing this thing like, uh, my name is Strictly DT. I was born in Seattle, Washington. Now living in da 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 da, and, and like every, it, I felt like a whole shift in the energy of the show of the set. And I felt weird. Like, why do I have to like explain myself like that? Yeah, but people need to know they need a little bit of backstory yeah. because otherwise they go, all right, this guy's from Perth, and all of a sudden yeah. he's come out here with this strong American, American accent. I guess that yeah, yeah. They, it comes back to trying hard or being a yeah. try hard because <laughs> if you come out, if you're born in Perth and you've got an American accent when you rap, mm. you're a try hard. You're trying True. hard to be something you're not. Yeah, but, but they, that was the assumption, I guess. Exactly, but and you've it got became... to, people take you for face value. They yeah. go, "He's from Perth, man. Is yeah. he actually putting on this accent?" Yeah, and it happens. It's it literally. I think. Every time I like, I laugh because every time I I found different ways of like one guy, one guy was real straight up with me. He was like, he was like, Hey man, that was a really good set. And I was like, thank you. And he's like, where are you from? And I was like, I was, I was born in Seattle, but I live, I just moved here. And he's like, ah, so everyone thinks you're faking an accent out here. And I just thought I'd let you know that you might want to. And, and that's when I was like, oh, that's where it really like made sense to me. But then would you question someone from the UK rapping in a UK accent? No, of course not. But you th- you need to understand that that's where they're from. True. What about a singer? Well, the singing thing that often gets me, man, because mm. a lot of people that'll be Australian or whatever, they'll be singing. They'll be like, "I can't do," th-. and I'm like, "Hang on." Mm. You would say can't, can't. yeah. Right? <laughs> like you would say that, yeah. but they get into their thing, and it's the same with that Eng- like the UK Brit pop thing. They mm-hmm. put on this different accent, mm-hmm. and that, and then you're like, "Oh, that's not how you talk." Yeah, but it, it, that's. I know it's 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 one of these like parallels where I constantly like I'm always brought into it because I'm American. So yeah. I I always I want to put it to bed, but I can't because every time I say I'm not going to say it. It's funny, man. Uh, <laughs> the, the dude who owns this pub that I used to go to a lot when I lived in the city still, yeah. he's an American dude who's lived here for 20 something years. Yeah. And he kind of floats in and out of this American Aussie oh, accent. Yeah. And it's so funny. He'll be like, hey, Maloney, how you going, mate? Do you want a beer? And I'm like, are you English? Are you American? Are you Australian? But he doesn't mean to. He just yeah. kind of flows through the whole thing. That's my son right at the moment. He's yeah. got like he's got a mixture because he's got he goes to school, he gets the words, and then he comes here and he speaks to me. Yeah. So he goes in and out, and everyone's like, 
what the what is happening here? Yeah, and his and his mum was, is 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 Australian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's going to get a bit of that. Both. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And it's it's just funny because he says a few words and then he's saying like he's like it's vitamin. I was like, no, I say vitamin. He's like, it's vitamin. vitamin? I say vitamin too. Yeah, it's <laughs> vitamin. But see, my my wife says vitamin. So like it's yeah. it's just he's got two different. He keeps thinking what is right, what is What's wrong, wrong? trying to get it. Yeah. What's this can made out of, man? Aluminum. <laughs> See, I would never yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I, that was the other one that he would say that I constantly, I can't, I don't think I could ever say aluminium. <laughs> I have to think, I have to think about it because it really is like, wait, what is it? It's like a whole different word. <laughs> oh, Funny. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the quirks of uh, speaking the same language. But even when I was in the US mm. 10 years ago, People be like, are you from Boston? And I'm like, nah, man, I'm from Australia. And they're like, <laughs> oh, I couldn't figure out where that accent's from. Yeah. It's just like we speak the same language, but there's so many subtle differences. And in America, there's so many accents. You know what's funny? My American family think I have an Australian accent. Well, it, it, it comes in. It doesn't come in and out? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you can notice because a lot of people don't notice. And no. I'm like, I feel like I do. But the biggest thing that took – the biggest takeaway it was that when I was there, I would – you, we tend to have a tendency of finishing a sentence and raising our pitch at the end. Yeah. So it sounds like a question. <laughs> so every time I say it, they're thinking, are you asking me or are you telling me? What's going on here? Like, why are you talking? Like, they used to get so mad at me for yeah. doing that. It, ha- it happens here as well to a lesser <laughs> extent. I've got friends that have moved to Queensland for a bit yeah. and they'll finish every sentence with A. And I'm like, man, that's so annoying. They're like, <laughs> I don't even notice I'm doing it A. And I'm like, you're doing it right now. It's fun. We do have it here, but it's not, a, yeah. it's not as prevalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I used to love when, like, when I was coming, when I was growing up in Perth, there used to be guys that came out from like you know uh broom or something yeah and they their accent is so aka thick i can get i and it's so cool because i'm like i don't actually know what you're saying Same. it's like it's it's amazing because i didn't think i could understand it when i first moved here i couldn't understand what people were saying before but then he was a whole like there was a whole nother level of it it's it's amazing have you heard irish people speak english to each other i don't know what's no, yeah. going on. that's my heritage and i'm still like i don't know what these guys are talking about <laughs> it's an instant killer man you go to a pub and you have a Beer with a couple of Irish guys. Yeah, three beers in, I'm like, I'm gonna know what, what yeah. are these guys on about. That's true. Like, yeah. I think about that, especially even with uh, the Scottish accent, is really hard for me that's, to understand too. That's hard. That's hard, right? Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Um, okay, we got on a language tangent. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Let's get back <laughs> on your personal journey, man. Look, looking at your bio, right? Yes. Yeah. You've supported a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of big names. Can't even list them all, but then who are some of your favorites? Uh, my my favorite so has well, I'm gonna say my favorite artist. I'm not gonna say my favorite gig because most deaf supporting most deaf in common when they came was huge. like a huge, probably one of my biggest things. But that show was a nightmare and a half for you or for them for every supporting artist. Okay, so. Do you want me to tell the story? Yeah, for sure. All right, all right. So, set the scene. Where are we? What year is it? We're in Perth. I can't remember what year, but they were doing and Soul it, uh, Soul Fest. So, most deaf is Yasin Bay at this stage? Yeah, no, I think he was most deaf. I think he was most deaf. Yeah, he was still most deaf at this stage. So, this is before that. And Common was, they were both doing Soul Fest. And, and I don't think Soul Fest came to Perth. So, we flew to Melbourne to watch Soul Fest. Didn't that? And badly, Soul Fest? No, that was this the last year. There okay. was a year before. This was the year before that. Before she so, hit the fan. Yeah, exactly. So w- the year before that one, th- we were there. We're watching. And it was like, this is great. Then they announced that s- most deaf and common are performing in Perth. And then we um, we got asked if we want to support. And I said, 100,000%. I will fly <laughs> back right now. We're going to get it in. And then they were like, can you push tickets? I was like, I will do whatever you need me to do. I sold like probably like 20 something 20 30 tickets right so i've got thousands of dollars in my backpack we pull up to the gig sound check there was me i'm pretty sure it was bitter belief rob shaker i can't for the life of me remember the other ones but there was about a four or five uh, it might have been dad's but i can't remember um there was about a four like four crews about to go for sound check we pull up there's nothing set for the uh for the support acts 
And they were like, we didn't even know you guys were here. I'm like, well, our names are on the flyer. What do you mean? And like, they're like, well, the 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 um, venue has not been informed that you guys are performing, so you're not performing. Wow. And I looked at I looked at my girlfriend at the time. I was like, you do not give no money to anyone before. I if like until I get on and off the stage. It's like if we don't get on this stage tonight, I'm capping all this money. Like I I don't care. And then um, we were going back and forth, and we were like, you guys, it shouldn't be hard to set up some te- some CDJs and a fucking mic. Like let's just work or pull our heads in, do it. The show the the doors were opening ten minutes prior. Or I'm actually sure, I'm pretty sure the doors were already open. And they finally said, all right, we've organized a microphone and some a DJ, like some CDJs. Um, but you guys will all get five minutes. And Bitter and everyone was like, nah, fuck this. You guys are fucking like this. He fully pulled it. And he was like, nah, this is ridiculous. And I'm looking, I'm like, man, I really should like roll with this. And I was like looking and I'm looking back and forth. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I need to take this guy. I really want to uh, like perform and I don't care. I'll m- m- type it. Like I literally went downstairs, took a 15 minute set and condensed it into five. So I was doing one verse here, cut, chopped into this second verse here. Collage. A hook. Yeah. yeah. Literally went nonstop. And then. Um, before I jumped on stage, I just want I gave a quick shout out to all the other support acts and said that because they walked, they walked, and I gave them a shout out and said like, um, shout out to these like these guys like we need to do better for our support acts because this is ridiculous. I've only got five minutes, so fuck this, let's go. And I like ripped a whole five minute set, and it went amazing Mm -hmm. but that whole incident just made me think like we just don't have like support this is what this is kind of what i mean like i'm using you to move tickets that's right Mm -hmm. and when we came to it and did our side of the deal they didn't tell us we were only gonna have five minutes that's that's painful in itself they used you as promoters yeah that's right and that's what like uh, when when i'm thinking about like when i say you know we don't put our own up you know, I think of like, you know, the promoters that don't allow us to get fucking 10 minutes or, um, you know, they just put it, they just focus on the main act, which uh, of course you need to, but there needs to be at least 10% energy put towards the support acts that are also trying to put on for their city. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so did you get to meet Common and most of? I was at the door and I was about to knock. And then I pulled back and I said to you myself, I, yeah, I was I'm like, a yeah, I, I don't want to come in like, and because I was so pissed off about that whole yeah. scenario, I felt they like they probably had no idea. They didn't. They, I knew they wouldn't, but I felt like my energy was off and I felt like I don't want to feel like I need to meet. Like it yeah. was just too, it just didn't happen naturally compared to like exhibit exhibit was different. Like, after my set, everything went smoothly. Where they was the exhibit one? Same place. Right. Yeah, Metro City. So, but he's got elusive behind him who, who at, handled that. Yeah. That's right. So this was this was that was my first very big um, act, and like it felt so more natural. Mm-hmm. And his door was open, and he seems like a good guy he, from he, what I can gather. Yeah, and like I had a chat with him and was explaining like how funny he was when they were on. Um, What's that one? You are the weakest link. Yeah. And he was with Nate Dog and <laughs> Rev Run and bro. It was like I remember like I was losing it and I told him I was like, I just remember the story that you you and Nate Dog and remember at and she asked Nate Dog, why are your hands in your pocket? And he said, Because in, in case I don't steal something. <laughs> and like <laughs> exhibit like busted out laughing. He's like, I fucking remember that. And he's like, I couldn't believe he said that to her. And we it was like that felt really genuine and natural. Yeah. So I, I don't want to, I would, when it came to that, and he's, most def is like my top five. Mm-hmm. So I said to myself, like, there's going to be another chance for me to do this. Like, yeah. I, I don't need to do this now. Everything feels like I'm not even, they don't, like, the whole whatever doesn't want us here. Like, they didn't want us, the supports here anyway. So I just felt, I'm going to leave it. And I've actually just hit up um astral people and them to i did a little thing on instagram saying like i've been hitting emailing i've been got to hit up and i did a little freestyle over one of most def's beats because he's coming Mm. so i want to i'm going to try and link in and get that support slot yeah he's coming to do a whole show of just a single album yes yeah Yeah, that album yeah and i love that album so i i wanted to 
either way, I'm going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I would love to be a, a support, but if not, at least yeah. I'm going to go and enjoy the show. And I think Exhibit's coming back too. Is he? He's um, Exhibit's coming back with D12, which now is only two members. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And um, Exhibit and someone else. Obi Trice. No, yeah. that's crazy. Obi Trice. Who's did, bringing him? I don't know. I've seen it on, on socials. I'm not sure. All right, because the last time it was super disrespectful the way he came. Like, not him, like the promoter. The they, yeah. The promoters, yeah. The And uh, I don't know if you saw that promoter that brought Mad Child recently. Um, no, but it was at Laundry, though, because I saw a photo with him and Dave who was on a few weeks ago. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was a whole thing in itself. Um, Mad Child and Cogs, shout out to Cogs, he's from Perth. Um, they had a whole thing with the promoter just being unorganized, wasn't organizing flights, didn't do this. He was like drunk the whole time. Like an Australian promoter or American promoter? Australian. I think he's Sydney or Brisbane. I can't I, I Patrick something, I can't remember. Um but I think it's Rap Ticks is the people. Um and it was like he posted it and they were like a fight. He posted the fight and everything. It was like a whole thing. I'll send it to you because it was it was wild. And it's just like that's the thing. Like you you've got you've got all these promoters that would have loved to bring Mad Child down. And Cogs has his own following too. So it would make for a really good tour. But when you put it in the hands, and I say that because that same guy brought Exhibit. Yeah. And Exhibit like fully almost had a punch up with them as well because same thing nothing was organized dude is drunk he put himself on as a support like all of this stuff was just super ratchet so yeah, okay. it, it that that just goes to show that we just have, we have to do better yeah <laughs> can't be doing that for sure man and what any other notable supports before we move on because there's yeah. a list as long yeah 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 of course oh sorry that um on, we got <laughs> we got bone thugs i've done bone thugs a couple of times that's, that's big i've i've i think i did sierra once but like i there was a quick like quick 10 minute set um Jaw Rule. I did a jaw rule once uh that was fun yeah so there was like uh again another it was like another competition that got me um that got me to perform. And I got to perform right before. Um, was it Jaw Rule? There was there was someone else. There was Stan Walker and Jaw Rule. They're kind of like right there. So it was it was crazy. Got to say, got to see them backstage and and uh, Travis McCoy as well. Got to meet him. It was cool. Yeah. Um, and then support wise, we've got you know I've supported Downside, uh, Briggs, yeah. How. Uh, the the local legends and uh, draft once uh, actually draft was probably one of my recent ones here in Melbourne. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Was that at the Croxton? And that was at um, Nightcap. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, Sweet he did. Yeah, he did really well there too. It's it just it's it's a quite unique venue. Yeah. Um, just because it's in the middle. Yeah. And so like when it's like I'm 360 sort of yeah, thing, yeah. So when I'm performing, I'm like, where do I like I want to stand here, but then there's people you need here. to be revolving. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because he had a bit of a hiatus for a while. He came back with an album a couple of, like a year. Yeah. Yeah, a yeah. year or so ago. Because he's doing his like he's doing restaurants or something. He, he had a cafe. Yeah. So I think that's when he t- took the hiatus, is when he opened up a cafe. And um I don't know. I think I think he's I don't know if he sold it or he like did something to it because he might have like t- taken a step back. Maybe it's gone. It's gone really well, and he's gonna take a step back and go jump back into music. But yeah, he's been recently re- um, releasing music and merch, and yeah, he did. A, he's done a couple of tours now yeah. since um, since the either departure of the cafe or the sale or selling it. Yeah. So he's doing wild, and like again, same thing. These guys w- like worked really hard to get to where they are. Imagine if they lived here; it would be so much uh, easier for them to hit up and down. Yeah, for sure. The, yeah, the man, the whole West thing is like, it's is very disconnected to the East Coast, very mm. much so. Like not just geographically, but yeah. it's just like you like if you're gonna logistically travel a tour, like that's mm-hmm. a long way out of your it's way. A to lot go of money too. One, one or two cities, two shows. You that's know? right. Yeah, man. That's like well, that's why whenever like when Kendrick came for the first time back in like two thousand and I think it was nine. Um, he did like the Astor Theater, and just to think that that he, they would make it there for such a young, like for such a young part of his career, to think that he could still come out there is like we get 
we give so much thanks to the people who still make an effort to come out to Perth because it's we know nine times out of ten they're not. Yeah, and for it's sure. so annoying. They called WA wait a while. <laughs> I was so annoyed at that too. I was like, actually, makes me so mad. Yeah, <laughs> but it's kind of cool for Melbourne culture because we get people coming here from other cities like Hobart, mm. Perth to go see a gig because they may not travel there, which is cool for tourism. Yeah. And and it gives people an excuse to come to a city like Melbourne or yeah. Sydney. But the dilemma that happens, right, is that we spend all this money to go there and then they cancel or they don't. And now, now we got a trip to Melbourne and we ain't got the Like, that's happened a few times. I think, was it a Wu-Tang? No, I don't know if it was a Wu-Tang thing, but like a, a, a tour who's canceled last minute or something and we all bought f- tickets over. And I think that might have happened in the Wu-Tang Sydney gig at the Sold Opera out. Yeah. Uh, not sold out. Shoot, that's the recent one. Um, Soul Fest. Yeah. They... they they went to shit last minute and we were here and we had bought the accommodation and thing yeah. and we were just like, well, now what? Yeah. You know, it was kind of annoying, but I get what you're saying. Like, it is a good time to bring in, but we don't even know like Melbourne like that. So like now we're just like in the middle of the city, like what do we do? For sure, man. <laughs> but so what? Okay. So this is a good segue into Melbourne. So mm. eventually after starting your music career in Perth, supporting a lot of Amazing acts mm-hmm. there. You decide it's time to sort of make the trek. So yeah. W- w- did you think about Sydney or it was just always going to be Melbourne? Nah. So my um, my wife's mom lives here. Yep. And so she moved to Perth for like me, our relationship. Yep. She was brought up in Perth, but she, she, recent, she moved to Melbourne with her mom and her mom was down this end. So when she moved back to Perth, we had our, our son and she was like, I really need to be close to my mom. I really have an ear- the yearning for it. So I said, yeah. Especially well, after actually, you have a kid, you want family. That's well, right. Yeah. I said, fair enough. I said, I've actually wanted to try Melbourne because I've noticed the few times I've come here and done a gig, it felt... So I felt like I connected mm-hmm. with a lot of people. Um, and so when I did that, I said, let's, let's give it a shot. Worst case scenario, we move back. Like yeah. we don't need to um, worry about it. But we came in 2018 um, and the first two years was great. Then COVID hit. Yeah. So now we're like, we don't even know if we're loving it or not because we're really hating the lockdown. <laughs> yeah. And everyone back in Perth is like, oh, what are you doing there? We're man? loving it here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, and even friends from here move back. Yeah. They like a lot of them jump ship. So it was like really hard for us to think like, do we love it or do we hate it at the moment because of what's happening right now? Yeah. And I'm glad we set it, set it out because I mean, even in those two years, like I got to meet amazing people. Same thing. Got in, uh, invited to do the bars of steel. Yep. Like I met Dietz, like I mean, meeting all these people. So let's not gloss over that. The bars of steel. And yeah. Dietz was an instrumental factor or how did that come to be because for people that don't know, bars of steel is like the fire in the booth type scenario. True for for Triple J. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was cool. What I initially did was I just literally wrote a story or a post saying, "What does it take to get on to bars of steel?" I'm and this just is on Facebook or Instagram. Probably both. Right. Yeah, I probably linked them, so I probably did the both and. Um, like few people were not, didn't nothing came back of it right, but. Deets was like, yeah, what what does it take? I'm like, I don't know. I did was you like, know Deets at this stage? I did. So he was one of the first people I met when I, when I got here because I knew he had the get down. And he does a lot for independent artists yes. and Aussie Melbourne scene and anyone. He I link death. him with whoever. It might be coming from Perth. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, if you're doing a gig around this time, hit hit Deets up yeah. because he's the one that can bring a crowd for you and it'll be it'll be great. He's really I love I love everything about what he does and he tries to keep it, you know, you know, pure to the point where we're where he nothing feels, you know, shady and he's upfront with everyone and he's kind. I yeah, I just love how he work, how he moves. Mm-hmm. So I I've been speaking to him. I've been coming out to gigs for him like just to watch and support the people that are coming out. Um and he's like, "Yeah, I'm going to hit him up. Like, let's see what happens." And he just I think he just messaged him and said, "What's it take? Like, we work with a lot of artists. I'm sure we can work something out." And they hit they hit back and was like, "Well, we we like um Motley, Nina Nicole, Strictly DT." And it was like spice something. I can't remember the other girl's name. I apologize. But she didn't end up coming anyway because she just said she couldn't do it. Yeah. But they only gave us like four days. So and this is at the Melbourne studio or the Sydney studio? Sydney. Yeah. So you've got to go to that Sydney studio in Glebe or wherever it is. Yeah. yeah. So we were like, 
we he's like, bro, they hit back. They want you, Motley, this and this. And I was like, all right, so what do we need to do? And they were like, well, we've got four days. Um, do, will you be ready? I'm like, I will. I don't know. I'll just do it. Just it whatever. It, yeah, I'll say yes now and figure it out the way. And so, like, I I, for, I quickly went in, put us in a group chat, and it was like, all right, Airbnbs, we doing this together. Do you want to do it separate? And it was like, it'll cost cheaper. It was like some two, three bedrooms for this could be like two, three hundred dollars for a night. And they were like, yep, we link it up. The one girl, home girl, pulled out. She said she's not coming. So I was like, all right, great. So now we just need this many rooms. Um, we got flights, and we can, yeah, we'll just catch up there. And we just, we literally put our heads together and, and put our money together to just get there. We did it. And then it was it was kind of funny, too, because when we got there, there was a strange energy mm. in there. In, and the, in the studio. In the studio, yeah. right? The 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 camera people, the, like the presenters were cool. They were all chill and they were very friendly and all that. But everyone else just felt like off. It's a big, like I've been to that studio. It's big, huge, mm. fucking, like multi-story. Yeah. You've got a sign in and everything i'm over here looking for bluey trying to get an autograph like <laughs> this is like this place was like massive they had like a huge, huge so yeah, yeah i'm looking at it like man like the badges they made like a full laminated badge for you and yeah. i'm like bro this is like next level it, it, it's funny to think that that's all like just the abc has such a like stigma that it doesn't have any money and then when you go to somewhere like that you're like yes. this is next Bullshit. level like charlie at the chocolate factory glass elevators and stuff yeah man. exactly yeah. so i like we were just like kind of spun out i was like wow like this is this is where this is here and, yeah. and like because like i my son is like still he's like newborn like we're just doing abc kids 90 percent of the day yep. i'm like all right cool so this is where he this person here like we got <laughs> peppa pigs over here this is the i was like oh this is crazy right and then um then they take us upstairs and there's like it's like a little corner like triple j just has like a corner in this massive the building's impressive exactly exactly so you're like you would think it was like much bigger but it's still it's a massive conglomerate um but yeah, we pulled in, we did, we started, we were like doing, we were, luckily, I was very fortunate that we were all together because we, we all felt it, but we were like, you know what, bring our energy, we'll, we'll, we'll reset it however we need to do it, like gassing each other up, you know, supporting each other, like when they're doing theirs, like we're in the background, like hyping and all that, um, but after we did it, they the they actually turned and they were like, look, guys, like, sorry, we get a lot of people coming through here and they're really arrogant and they're really like, they're just cocky and we just kind of over it. And I was like, oh, he's like, but you guys came in, you were respectful and you guys killed it. Like we were very inspired and we felt and we're like, they were just apologetic to it. And I was like, oh, that's that's nice. Like, I'm glad that we could just overcome whatever that felt like. Because I was like, I was actually like asking them, like, y'all, y'all feel like a bit unwanted almost. Was it like, from the producers? Or no, the, or no, that, no, 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 no. The producers and the presenters. It was just like the crew, like camera crew and this and the, and yeah. like just some people around. But I can understand if people are being disrespectful every single day, mm. like you don't know who you're going to get. So you might as well just yeah. come with that energy so yeah. that you're not already feeling. Yeah. And they just said that, These dudes that come from Melbourne, they're going to be dickheads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so like, it just goes to show, like, we were like, you know, it really helps to for us to just make sure we bring our own energy. And not to mention, like, we are we are all unsigned artists. You know, I think a lot of people that get in there are because of the managers or the labels or this. So yeah. they're like, you know, we feel do like we a lot of do people. This and you want your hungry to do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we want to do this for the culture more than anything. We want to show that there are artists out here that can really spit and they don't need a... Uh, a label or a manager to be knocking on the door every three seconds. Was Hal the guy running that then? Or was no. he, he? Oh, he was running it, but he, i um, sorry to interrupt. That's right. um, he was running it, but there were other presenters. So we had, we had Ebony. Oh, yep. Yep. Yeah. We had Ebony at the time. And then, um, and she loves her hip hop. She was a yeah. big advocate for hip hop. Yeah. She was so cool. Like she mm. was very, everyone, like I said, like they were all very cool. It was just a, a different energy from others other aspects of it yeah. um, but all in all it ended up being a really dope experience and then next thing you know we're like just done and now we're like all right now what we're we just gonna fly back <laughs> <laughs> That's it. but when that how long after you recorded it to when it actually gets released on youtube oh that probably took like it was less than a month. Right. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe mine was like two weeks and theirs was like three or four. And did you see some views and you're like, wow, this is. Yeah, that was probably one of the biggest like things online. Mm -hmm. For some reason, yeah, 
for some reason when I upload stuff, I have I average like 200 views or something like that, you know, because I guess everyone's rapping nowadays. Yeah. So nowadays I, I don't put too many like freestyles up because I'm like, I've spent a lot of time writing these. I'm going to wait till we're out in the, out on stage and we're all s trading ciphers. Cause I know it'll be more appreciated there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it jumped up a lot and it like a lot of followers, but also just engagement. And people just like, you know, I still look at, I look at it and I'm like, man, these, these comments are overwhelmingly like supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, if we had this, this sort of platform, platform, that's the thing to get other, like I, I've, I've constantly since the guy was like, yeah, yeah. Send us artists. We would love to. I sent them 10 artists. I, I can say I sent them maybe three or four emails of different artists that I would recommend would do really well. Um, but I haven't seen any of them on there since. Yeah. But they also have to have that hunger and passion and, and probably the deets behind them that's going to go, let's go. We've yeah. got to get an Airbnb. We've got to pay for our flights. Yeah. This is all worth it and this is to show the culture. Yeah, yeah. and like it's – it's like to me – I would think that there are so there's so many artists that are willing like that are that are deserving of that and I guess the it it really depends on the people who will put up to go fly over and put accommodation like it's a very it's a very expensive but, ticket. But that's it man but the, the the platform is what it's all about and it goes to show you that the quality is there but m most people don't have the platform. Mm, that's and right. That's that's the thing. Yeah. You could have spat the same verse on your own channel mm -hmm. or whatever and like you said you might get a few hundred views but then that's They've right. got a, a network yeah. of people that already follow them. So it just goes to show you just got to get the right angle to, yeah, the same just, content. Yeah, just be ready. And just be ready. Like I always tell I always tell the younger kids that are like – that are rapping now, you know. Like I'm not saying the kids are adults, but – I say that all the time. Yeah, because I'm an old head under now. 30 is a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like I'll tell young – I always say to young Shogun and all that. I'm like, bro, like you're at this age now. Just do whatever. Like you have no kids. You have no – like you may – I don't know if you're living – I don't know your living standards, but like you can literally put it all on music right now and be fine. It's like whereas like I tell you now, I'm – being me being you know my age and me having a son and a wife and now I have to worry about this like I definitely need to take energy out to put here and I have no issues doing that but while you're here just run for it like for sure. just go and that and the, and the mentality of yeah just say yes and figure the rest out that's mm. the right way to do it yeah because those opportunities may not come back again. You know? Yeah, that's right. So you just say yeah, and then the rest yeah. will fall into place. That was what the that was one of the first um. First lessons from Rich Dad Poor Dad, which was like he said. I did have that book years ago, but I don't think I read it. I didn't read it. I listened to it on <laughs> Someone YouTube. Gave it to, <laughs> Someone gave it to me when I was like, yeah. 18, 19. It's cool. It, it's cool. I, I tend to listen to a lot of stuff while I'm at work. So yeah. like if I'm doing something, I'll listen to I would listen to that book. And what he was saying is that rich people don't think of excuses why not to do something. They try and figure it out. Like so if they're saying you can't do this, they're like, How can we do this? It's more like how can we get around this? How can we figure it out? How can we manage this? Yep. And so with that mentality was like, that should be all of us. We yep. should all think like that. Because if we're like, oh, I can't do it. The cameras are too expensive. Yes. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> yeah. No, no, totally. But there, there is people have to work within their means. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's totally a thing. Like I've had people message me like, oh, I like the quality of your podcast and, you know, what equipment do you use? And then I tell them, they're like, that shit's really expensive. And mm -hmm. I'm like, it is. But you, well, first of all, you've asked me, so I've told you yeah, what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, it's not like but it's also your... <laughs> like you got to, you you've got to back yourself at some stage before, like to pull the trigger on something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Another thing he said was, um, we tend to spend money on liabilities or assets. Yeah. So he's like, if, if you're spending more money on liabilities than assets, like this is an asset. Yeah. You can utilize this stuff and it may not it may not make a return today, but it'll make a return tomorrow yeah. or the next day. And or that's the same in thing. Ten years time. Or maybe ten years not. Time when I'm <laughs> when I'm retiring. <laughs> no, but that's that's what it is. I go and buy materials for work. I use the materials for the job to that I get paid for. Well, so yeah. it's it's in that it's in that it's realm. Smart money. Yeah, it's smart. But see, that's the thing that I, I I liken that to people that don't own a house and they'll go and buy a hundred thousand dollar car. Right, mm. which is like okay if you like the car, mm -hmm. but that's a deposit for a house, a liability. That's a liability. Yeah, right. There's good debt and there's bad debt. Yeah, mortgage is generally good debt. Yeah, car repayments bad debt. Yes, you need a car. 
do you need a hundred thousand dollar car? That's the <laughs> that's way. That's the I question. Think. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. The same thing. You don't need. Maybe you don't need this this camera, but you can. There's a hundred thousand cameras yeah. that you can have. Your phone has a camera, yeah. yes. and you can you can start there. Like yeah. it, someone oh, who is it? My wife's uh, my wife's mom. She said, um, one degree of a change will land you in a different destination. Oh, that's deep. Man. So yeah, that's it cool. doesn't need to be like you don't need to spend a hundred no. grand on this. But if I have a car that's that gets me there and yep. back and all that, then I've done it. Yeah. And you can you can scale up later. Like yes. you, you, that's the problem. People think that they can just jump in and be like, I'm gonna be a like everyone. I'm gonna be number one rapper. Yeah. You know. Then they get into it and they're like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the this is the idea. Like, there's never been an easier time for a creative or, or people that want to do something outside of the normal day to day job yeah. to do it because with an iPhone or with a computer, you can do it, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to start rapping, just grab your phone, start rapping into it, yeah. play a beat in the background off your fucking computer, yep. and eventually you can get the shit. Yeah, that you need to do it, and even yeah, you're right. It's easier now, and though like the hard part about my brain is because I came up in an era where you don't come out unless it's like a hundred percent, and you know, and now it's like you are okay to make mistakes, you are okay to do things on the fly, and it like this whole streaming stuff. It's all new to me, so it is. It's new for everyone. Yeah, and these kids are jumping on it so well and so quickly. I just think the difference between doing that and like clout chasing is where I find is corny like i think that shit is where the line should be like people doing things for the you know for that exposure yeah yeah the quick gratification yeah but times have definitely changed and i think that kids are more switched on and they see there's a path where i can apply myself put 10 years in to get to this point Mm. or i can just go live Throw shit against the wall and see what yeah. sticks. You know, yeah. they go for that easier option. I, I've I've been because sp- because I work with Halo. Like I've been working with a lot of the younger like singers, and I feel like they get a lot. They're they're very a lot of them are very overwhelmed at the at the thought of like you know putting up content, and some of them are very anxious. Like I see that that there are kids that just jump out and just do whatever, and it's great. But like to them, to others, they, they there's another side of the spectrum where they're like they're like, oh, like it's just too, it's too much. Yeah. Like they they feel a bit overwhelmed. And I think even Shogun was saying like, I don't like, I don't like the internet. Like I don't like doing that that stuff. Like putting things out like that, even though they kind of have to. I've got news for him. The internet's not going anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you, want to, you mentioned Halo. Do you want to break that down a little bit more yeah. about what you're doing there? Yeah, Halo Vocal Ensemble started with uh, Leona Tatafu. She's the director. Um, Alex from Let's Vibe linked me with her when they were doing something together. And since then, Leona and I have been you know, working really hard together in – just creating like a really dope space for singers and rappers. Mm -hmm. So she has been gigging around the city for 10 plus years and she's done things with a lot of notable R&B artists and singers and soul singers and all that. She's decided to now bring a lot of those singers in and we do like covers or in a bit of Like a choir vibe as as well. A choir vibe to it. And she said, if you can bring in the rappers and we make it like we fuse it all together, it would be a really good time. And since we've been doing it, it's been so much fun. And mm-hmm. uh, like more importantly to me, not only is the music amazing, but like we're bringing artists together that are usually by themselves. Yep. You know, we've had Tando, we've had Sully, we've had Emma, we've had Tyra, Sky, all of these guys. They do. Um, they do their music on their own and then bring it together. Ash, J. Dean, they are all individual amazing artists, but we seem to get a lot of um, views, not not just views, but like people looking at us when we're all together. Mm. So we've just applied that and just I bring a few rappers in the feature and they come in, they spit a verse or two and we tell them that this artist is, is gigging around. So make sure you follow them. And, and um, we just do gigs around the city and we've got Miss Risk is our manager. Mm -hmm. She's been giving us a lot of gig opportunities that she gigs and, and it's been 
flying since then. Like, awesome. I really think it's it's going to be something amazing once we start getting originals in. Yeah, for sure. Because that's what I said our next goal should be is like getting some originals down. Like, we do covers and medleys, and then I'll do my own original raps over them. Yeah. And then Nomad helps out too. He comes in um, from time to time, a lot of the time he's been. And then we'll try and get like a third to come in once off. You know, one six has come in and. We've had... Um, He's coming in next week here. Oh, word. Yeah. Great people. Yeah. Um, but Lolly, we've had, like, we've had a lot of rappers come in and do a couple of verses, and it's kind of nice to just bring everyone together. Yeah, for sure. It's it's like my dream. That's kind of like, like my dream as well. Yeah. Can you tweak any of those covers? I know this sounds like a, a bit of a lazy way to do it, but mm -hmm. can you tweak the covers into originals? You know what I mean? Take some, you know, because you've got already got the original raps on there. Yeah. Can you flip some of the lyrics? Can you flip some of the melodies and kind of make them into original tracks? You know? We kind of do. Like uh, probably our closest original would be um, Spotty. So there's a band that. Re and redid a rendition of you know you know the outcast yeah one of the greatest instruments it's man. so good yeah, yeah. and so that we use that and then we i i kind of wrote the hook for the choir and then we did our own verses so that's probably the closest to it but we the beat is not ours so if we found a different beef or 100 percent we could I'm but sure then no producers <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so like that i guess the 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 thing we need to do is get together and because this is another hard thing is that because there's so many of us there's a lot of ideas are there, is there people that are more passive than others? Like, because I'm, sure, I'm sure with that quiet vibe there's some people that are happy to not be that creative and just mm. go with the flow i guess you get a lot of people in the same room. It's going to be hard to get. Everybody. Yeah, we we've narrowed it down to like a core group so that we can kind of do a lot of the hard work behind, so that when we bring it to everyone, they just learn it. Like they could just learn the parts, which makes it we we're we're literally so new at this that we don't know where the lines are when it comes to like who's doing what. Like, uh, is there someone going to do merch? Is someone going to do this? So we've managed to just found of like find a core group that are happy to do a little bit more work than just sing and, and perform. Yeah. And the people who are singing and performing can just be shown, this is what we're doing. Here's this, this and that. And then show up here. For sure. Yeah. So we've got another gig down uh, next month, at the end of next month. And we're going to try and get, I'm hoping we can get an original, but we're doing a whole new set. Because we've been doing, you know, Kanye covers and um, Aretha Franklin covers, like a bunch of different things and, and medleys and all that. And I think we're going to try and switch it up. But I would love to get an original in. But yeah, but it's all sort of pretty soulful stuff by the sounds of it. Yeah, it's 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 so much fun. We've had so many great opportunities. We've performed before Baker Boy yep. at Hamer Hall. Which is, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and um, we've we've performed... Good acoustics, I'm guessing. Bro, man. it's <laughs> just... You just... you Like, I walk in and I'm like, hip-hop should not be he in yeah. here, but we are here. And that, that kind of feels, like, so good mm -hmm. to our souls. Um, the... There's a museum. There's a museum we performed at as well. Oh, I can't remember which one, but it was for like Melbourne Music Festival, yep. and uh, we've done Mumba Festival like three or four times. It's been it's been a good run, yeah. and I think we've only been at it for about four years, four or five years. So how do you balance that out with family and also working, man, and your own musical stuff? Oh, dude, this is the <laughs> this is the thing I'm constantly in therapy for. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I definitely feel like I might it's it may be it's balanced in my head <laughs> yeah. but like my wife my my work associates they all see me and say like you need to slow down <laughs> yeah. all the time but I feel I just feel energized like all of these things you even, need something to keep you going like, yeah you I do feel like I can't stop yeah. um I do get run down at times, but I am learning and practicing to actually like not feel bad for resting. So that's been a practice I've been having to do. Because, like, if I took you through, it'd be like this. Like, I'll try and make it really quick. Um, wake up at 6, 6.30. My son wakes up around that time, too. So whether I've gone out or not, that's the time you wake up. Um, I'm at work by 7, 7.30. And then I finish, usually finish anywhere between 2 and 4. Go back home. Play with my son. Maybe take him to the park or to the pools or whatever. Bring him back. She does dinner. We do bedtime. Um, 7 to 9.30, I'm with my wife. 
and she usually passes out. I literally bet for her to pass out around 9, 10 o'clock-ish. From 10 to 12, I'm doing, whether it's music, whether really? it's this, whether it's um, writing, that's usually the time. And if I'm writing music or, or like thinking of ideas, I'm usually doing it in the car, driving to and from work or in between jobs. Wow. So that's kind of what my day-to-day is like. And it, it's <laughs> full on, man. yeah, it's a bit hectic, but I, I, I have been practicing, you know, saying it's okay to not work on something for today. Yeah. Whereas like before I was like, hey, I didn't do this, man. I really am like, I'm slipping. Like I constantly critique myself like that and I hate it. Yeah. Don't be overcritical because I think that's what a lot of creative people do that they are critical on themselves. They're like, oh, if I relax here and do nothing for a little mm. bit, I could be doing something else. You need that downtime, man. I'm, uh, I'm traumatized by the, the, by the team no sleep people. All those people that started – remember that era where everyone was like, I don't sleep. Beyonce don't sleep. 50 Cent don't sleep. Like I was like, yeah, yeah, let's – yeah, that's it. And like I'm still trying to unlearn that now yeah. because I'm like – Sleeping's good for yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. It's like actually – needed for it <laughs> you need sleep man. yeah exactly so it's yeah like but i'm very blessed like my work um i've got my own tiling business tyler the creator and is that what it's called yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i work alongside with uh, aquavision and like subcon like it's it's my work is amazing i'm really happy with it um and and just to be able to un- them understand me as a rapper as well, they s- I'll say to them like even to link this up, they got me a job like I found a job down this end yep. so that I could come down here and do it, awesome. you know, and yeah. and that kind of support to me, I will always be like faithful for that and thankful for that for sure, man. Yeah. And I think that that's one thing that makes the music that comes out of Melbourne's underground so passionate is because everyone has to work a job like yeah there's not that many people making money from it you've got it you, you're doing it purely for the passion and the love a hundred percent yo any of you guys who think that like you don't have a job and you just do like rap like but <laughs> don't and if you're hiding a job even worse that's corny <laughs> we know you got a job it's okay if you work at mcdonald's and you rap and you rap about owning money and owning cars it's fine but don't just don't fake the funk we have work we got to make money and one day hopefully soon for you and for us <laughs> it will be the case but like we all have jobs and if Actually, I was just saying to a friend, um, it would be cool if we were open about that because all of us in hip hop come from so many different facets and backgrounds. Like, I can honestly help you. <laughs> like, I can re grout your shower or I can <laughs> clean and seal your shit. Like, okay. we should be able to like link up like that. We yeah. don't have to keep it hip hop, it can always b- venture out. I've got two bathrooms I'm going to be redoing this year, man. I've got, I can link you up, man. <laughs> and I haven't been doing many tiling jobs yet, but I definitely can help you still. I've got links with like other tilers as well. There you go. I'll link you up. Like, that's what I think this is, that, that's what I think hip hop should work on, focus yeah. on, is like us being able to help each other all facets. Like, yeah, we do, sure. we all do other stuff, and it's okay. I teach boxing, I play basketball, like, it's we have many Take talents. Easy, man. Take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> do you call the other Tylers you hang out with? Do you call them Mod Future? What do you call no, them? No. This is the Wolfgang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wolfgang. Yeah. I have a lot about that. that yeah. If I do have some Tyler friends, I should if do that. We make up a crew. Yeah. <laughs> make a donut. But yeah, for sure. <laughs> Sell some socks or something, yeah. man. Um, so tell us about what's coming up in the future. I don't look. We've jumped a lot all over the place, yeah. but I think we kind of got to where where you are now. My ADHD brain, you, I guess. Yeah, but that's all right. <laughs> but what's happening for the rest of 2020? 24 man um at this stage it is real it is a lot of um halo stuff mm-hmm. i am putting my name forward to oh that's another thing i really wanted yeah. to talk about but yeah, we yeah, don't no, have no, 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 just do it. just the like the yeah. grant side of things like yep. i'm applying for a grant to get my album that i released last year uh pressed to wax yep so grants are like to me i think is w- one thing that I don't think many artists are put on mm. and especially hip hop artists. Yep. And even if you are put onto it, I don't think they're very open to giving grants to hip hop artists. Yeah. But if you can, and if you do, it is so lucrative. If it wasn't for the grant for my album, I wouldn't have been able to pay everyone that participated in the album and it feels to me so much more um you know just feel energetically if yeah you can, if you can pay yeah yeah and like give them 
uh, more than what I could even pay them in this in this time of like making something that I think is like this is great. I feel like this to me will be my classic, yeah. and I paid everyone like right. You feel good about it, and I yeah. feel so good about it. And For that's sure. where I'm like, I don't think I'll do another album without that. that. And the thing is with grants is they are there all the time, but people obviously a don't know about them. Mm. B, aren't that good at applying for mm-hmm. them. Or C, just think, fuck, man. That's it's over where, where do I, Yeah. And the, th- the thing is, okay, Bias B is a godfather of Aussie hip hop. Mm-hmm. His first album was put together with like a grant program or a program for p- get people to work and make money to mm. actually do something creative. Yeah. That was years ago. Yeah. A lot of people ha- that have been successful have got a kickstart from those sort of grants and stuff. So <laughs> there's, no, there's no fucking shame in doing it. Yeah. Get out there and give it a go. Yeah, and like if you're not a drug dealer, then <laughs> what else can you do? Dude, yeah. It's like I, I used to get so tight. I'd be looking at like I know rappers that are drug dealers and just making so like just spending it all on equipment and this. Studios. And I'm looking at it like, bro, I would I, if I wasn't a hater, I snitch on you so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I used to be so tight. I'd be like, man, I should just pick up this brick and freaking sell it right now so I could just get this album going or I could get this. But like for those who, yeah, I managed, I'm so grateful to have found another way and had help. Like I put it out there. Anyone could help me. Tando helped me. Anna helped me. Like everyone gave like their opinion on it and what you need to do. And it's like to me, I was like, I got mad because I'm like, this lingo isn't isn't available for us. Mm -hmm. Like without your guys' help, I wouldn't have been able to get it. Mm -hmm. But still, like I'm glad that they there are people out there that are willing to help you. So you gotta put it out there and make the initiative of doing it. Yeah. The sad thing is with the grants is it's generally the same sort of people that get it all the time because they're good at writing the proposals. That's right. You know I mean and Chat GPT now can help with all of that. Ah, there you go. So yeah. we are at a stage now where you can really do it and you just got to put your specific details and why this is important. Yeah. And they will be able to cut, they will make the meat of it and you just got to edit it up to make it your, make it yours. Yeah. And it makes a world of difference to, to be able to make an album, pay everyone and you get it done in half the time. Like I remember when I got it, I was like, oh, great, this is going to be easy. It actually is a lot harder because not only are you paying everyone, now everyone's doing the work and they're asking for your opinion on this and asking, do you want it like this? You've got to have a product that everyone's happy with. Yeah, so now I'm like, wow, like I'm working working twice as hard now trying to meet everyone's expectations, get them all the assets, you know, like working with PR agencies, like all of that I've never done before. So me trying to be professional (laughs) and and be like, oh, yeah. Fit that into your schedule. I can do, yeah, (laughs) fit that in. It's like me making sure, and I, it was it ran me down, but I I still like I loved every moment because everyone was doing it like mm-hmm. with me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if people want to work with you, if people want to get a verse from you, if people want to get involved with Halo, well, how do they reach out? How do they find DT? Okay, you can find me at Strictly DT on pretty much all platinum uh, platforms. If you want to get with Halo, please just message Halo Vocal Ensemble. Do not ask me like <laughs> what, how, but I, I honestly do keep a list of rappers that I think are like – very talented and whenever halo asks i send them whatever they're looking for so like if they're saying oh we would like someone for like a um a christmas special i'm not gonna go and get you know um spanion yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) so it's like like i do it for whatever fits the show but there's so many rappers out there that i know can fit any mold that they're going for so that's that verses for me just hit me up if i and i always tell i tell everyone if it hits my soul i'll write if it doesn't i will i'll kindly respectfully reject and maybe try another time yeah, and yeah. give someone else the opportunity. Of course, I said I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just do it for the opportunity. One guy hit me up. He's like, oh, I got Ghostface on this, on this thing, on this track, and I said, cool. Well, like, send me the verse, and then he sent it. And I was like, I, I really want to. I said, I, I would, but I would be going against my morals and values if I said I can write to this, and it just didn't hit me. So, wow. but he hit me up with another one, and he said this one. Um, this one had another artist that was really dope. And I was like, oh, cool. Inspector. Yeah. Inspector Deck. All right. Yeah. I got it easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, and that, okay. 
before yep. we do wrap it up, that mm-hmm. in so okay, so tell us about some of these verses and also Red Man giving you props as well. Oh, okay. Um, so the verse is optimistic MCs from Perth. He he gets he's been working so hard. He works so hard at just making really dope underground albums. Yeah, who's part of downside, yeah? No. No, not Optimus, no. Not Optimus, oh. optimistic. Oh, optimistic. That's okay. the yeah, yeah, okay. optimist, yeah. So downside, those guys again, they deserve their props in this. Sure. They've helped me in my music career a lot. Um, I say this every time I get a chance because they put me on a support, main support, like a yep. lot. Um, but optimistic is a different MC who is who who basically um, just puts all of his money into you know creating underground uh, like art um, art, and he's done things with like Onyx and. And Method Man and Re- like he's got a long list, but like I tell him like, are you gonna get PR? You should do this. He's like, nah, bro, I don't fuck with any of that. I just want to make this music for me. And I'm like, cool. Like it's up to you, man. Like it's not. I just thought I would try and give you something that could help if you wanted to make it a bit more. But he's honestly, I think because he, he you know, he works in the mines, so he's quite comfortable where he's at. He's not losing, losing yeah. money. But like if there were anyone that was like in the struggle, you would yeah. probably think about that. But he's comfortable so i'm like man i'm just glad you're happy and you're making the music you want to make yeah. and that's basically what he wanted to but do he's getting dudes like ghostface inspector deck on verses yes and is this because i talks? i would hope so <laughs> i i don't go into the specifics of that because that's your business i'm like yeah. if you got it you got it like i remember i oh man i don't know if i should put that out but he like i remember i had the opportunity to do a verse uh, to do a, a song with, I think it was either Ray or Ghost, but they were charging crazy amounts for eight bars. Mm. And I said, I don't have, <laughs> I'm just going to say I'm broke. <laughs> I yeah. don't actually, I can I get it. You got to get paid. Can't do it. Yeah. And with that sort of stuff, do those guys, once they send it, they'll, see, I, that, those, what do they call them? Money bag verses or whatever. Mm. Cash brown paper bag. Yeah, brown paper, paper bag. bag with, paper bag. That, so, do, do they care if you put it out? Are you allowed to credit them? Like, how does that stuff even work? Well, because I haven't gotten into that yeah. space. It's a crazy space. Though. Yeah, and like, I even hear like I was listening to the Joe Budden podcast, and they were saying like, even after you've paid and got the verse and all that, they could still say no. Like, we don't want like the end product is like not. Nah, and they can still turn it out. I'm like, I'm not paying for that. Right, to not put it out. <laughs> to not put to it out. To play it to your friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but I did like the, I think the the next big thing I've, I should have mentioned that I I was putting the vinyl on wax or the album yeah. on wax, but I'm actually going to add a track on there and make it a, like a deluxe, make it a, a cool deluxe where it's like, I'm not putting it on streaming. Yeah. I'm going to put it on the, on the vinyl and only the people on the vinyl get it. Yeah. Um, but it's a, tra- it's a track with Chris Rivers. Cool. And I'm excited to drop that one because, well, at least on that, at least for now, because it's it's like it's a really dope song, um, and you know, like the legacy of Big Pun is like so relevant to me, and not relevant, I shouldn't say relevant, but like influential to me. Yeah, and his sure. son just kills it like that too. Yeah. So I just I, I he, when I hit him up on Instagram, it was just like, yep, it's this much, and I'll get it to you in like two weeks. And had you played pa- played him the instrument? Yeah, I you? played him. The, I even sent him a verse. So I sent him a verse and a hook, and I told him the premise of the song, and he got back and was like, yeah, this is dope. And and I told him that I'm gonna put a third verse, but I want it to aim towards what the third verse is gonna be about. Um, basically, it's like, um. I wanted to make it look like we were going to go to war to each with each other. So I was like talking about we were going to meet up and and meet up with your crew and you're going to meet up with your crew. We're going to meet in the middle, but it's actually going to us meet. It looks like we're going to battle, like fight each other, but we're actually going into the conference room to um, battle the government and tell them what's happening with our with our communities and that we need more, we need more support and stuff like that. Like it's a bit more conscious than the, but it it was like it was like kind of trapping people into thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be one of those like yeah, we're going to war type stuff. And it kind of is, but just not with the people we think it are. For sure. Man. And that's the main thing I usually I, I like beefing with. It's just like picking apart the things that the government is doing to us without us knowing and without us um, and w- or things that are not set right that we can easily fix. Mm. There's a guy called uh, Punter's Politics. Do you follow him? Yeah. He's I've just recently followed him and he breaks it down so concise 
to how Australia is doing when it comes to like oil and gas, Woolworths, farmers getting ripped off, like all of that. And I think this is like ammo for rappers. Like every rapper should be following this if we're talking for the conscious rappers to be like that. I've been talking about this for ages. It's just I didn't have like the super strong proof. I could just feel that this is this doesn't add up to this. Yeah. And why are we getting treated like this if this is happening here? You know? And with when I since following him, I'm like, yeah, this makes so much sense as to what what um government laws and, and lobbying um, lobbying with each other, you know, like the, the you think that the labor and and um and liberal are against each other. They're actually in. They actually work together in a lot of the things. They just play opposites to make us separate. Like they br- to break so us up. So we think we've got an option. Yes, exactly. And it's like they all kind of work in one and the same. And and that's where everything that all the cultural stuff that's happening today. We are actually separated. We're it's just to divide us away from each other. You know, mm. if you disagree on something and I disagree on something, we can still have a beer. But like, if they can say, "Well, but they believe in this," is they believe in this, and this is really like wrong or right, and they're like, "Well, we believe in this." Like, then you'd be like, "Oh, well, I don't want to hang out with that person anymore." Yeah. And now they got us separate so that we can't look at each other and be like, "Yeah, that isn't that is kind of fucked up." You know, <laughs> divide and conquer, man. Yep, that's what it is. That's it. Um. Red man. No, red man. Hang on. Rich man. Red, red, red man. Which man? Red, rich man. Red, <laughs> red man. Red man. Red Tell man. Tell us about it. It's an awesome shout out. Yeah, it was so cool. Like, I, I, it was like my friend Dean Blankfield. Oh, he's actually like my my cousin because that's my uh, wife's cousin. But um, he told me, I've got you something great for your birthday. And I said, all right, cool. And like, he, I don't know what he, like, I know he's like a, um, a coach, like he's a life coach and helps people with the relationships and business and all of this and all that business coach and all. Um, but he came over, he's like, I can't, I got to bring it to you. I was like, all right, cool. Bring it over. And he's like, he brings his laptop and he was like, you got me a laptop. And he's like, no, no. <laughs> Opens it up and it's like red man listening to parlay. That's the song that I was telling you about parlay. And I was like, what is happening? And I thought it was fake. I was like, this isn't, this isn't I, real. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, this isn't real. And he's like, yo, what's up, Strictly DT? I was like, oh, okay, hold on. He's like, I'm just listening to the old shit. And I'm listening. I'm like, this is fucking Red Man? <laughs> it's like, and then um, he's like, yeah, that's Red. I got Red Man. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And he goes, yeah. I was like, I don't understand what is happening. What is happening? And I freaked out. Didn't even know. He's like, yeah, I hit him up. And I was like, you just hit him up? And it's like funny because I hit him up after and I got no response. So I'm like, how did you just hit him up if I didn't yeah. even get it on? But he gives you mad props. Yeah, though. he gave props and like I sent it to Kez93 and I. it's funny because I like – he sent like a voice note. He's like, what the fuck? He's like, what the fuck? What the – and he's like, I start yelling in the, in the thing. Are you kidding me? Are you, like, are you telling me that one of my favorite rappers is listening to one of our songs? It was just so cool, man. Yeah. I couldn't I, – I felt really like – it felt nice to just be a little recognized, nice, you know. For sure, just that's for better pop. than than sales and streams. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh man, the streaming era, freaking the most annoying thing. Yeah. But yeah, when it comes to like getting props like that, like regardless if I ever see him or meet him again, like it's it's like things like that to make me feel like we're on the right path. Regardless, it doesn't matter where we're at, how many followers. It's just like yeah. get us in. The thing is, man, someone like that wouldn't go and say anything positive if he didn't like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, He'd exactly. be honest. He'd be like, be it might be your boy, but I don't like this <laughs> shit. You know what I mean? He would say that. I could imagine. Yeah, I could. I could just say what up, but I'm not listening to <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. So at least he does like it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And hopefully, who knows? It comes of of something one day. But I really, yeah, at that stage, I was like. That's such a cool birthday gift, bro. I was like, how did you do that? For sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, DT, man, we're just pushing two hours, dude. Beautiful. Um, I appreciate you coming down, and I'd love you to come in again. When you got your wax ready, come in. We'll have another chat. We'll be able to um, do another wrap. Uh, Do you want to shout out anybody before we wrap it up? Well, just shout out to 300 Podcasts for having me. 3,000. 3,000, 300, what is that? I keep looking at the 3,000 and it's like, I just, why did I, 3,000 podcasts. Thank you guys for having, you for having me and, um, you know, follow me at Strictly DT. And yeah, I just want to see more of like you more more communal stuff happening, and hopefully, I can't wait to see who else you have on here. Yeah, I've got some good rappers coming up. Yeah, I'm a fan of the podcast, so I'm like was super psyched. Yeah. Didn't think I was gonna be able to talk. I was like, I you was can like, talk, man. Yeah, 
was like, yeah, I, I, I noticed that now. I'm like, geez, I don't need my own podcast. Let's look. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. I appreciate you coming. Uh, let's have another beer. And yeah, come back soon. Bring some other people through, man. We'll get some more rappers in. For sure. I got, I've got a list I can bring you for, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. All right, man. Thanks for coming, dude. I appreciate it. Peace, brother. 3,000.